Hello, stream. Boy, I look like crap today. I'm not as tired as I appear, I promise. I sure do, Slurwin. Although, to be honest, I'm not great about updating there. I don't post very often. I retweet a lot of stuff, and I don't tweet when I go live, although I probably should. You know what? I'll, I'll tweet that I'm live right now. And thank you for reminding me. Greetings, traveler. Hey, Clooney man. Uh, today, we are beginning. We are beginning the final read through of the Mind Mage's Wrath. So the next thing that we the next the next things I guess that we have to do is uh, read through the Mind Mage's Wrath and uh, the Fire Mage's Vengeance, um, which are the uh, those are the two books that I published that Sterling and Stone never. No, sorry. Two of the three books that I published that Sterling and Stone never touched. They should be very, very clean with few, if any, errors. But there are a lot of things that have been uh, learned through Karen and I going through the other seven books. Sorry, the other six books. Um, so there may be small changes. There may be tiny little titchy little editing things and details. And there may be... <clears throat> Um, and there's a, there's a few things that we sort of realized, ow, um, in the process of the Alchemist Touch and Shadeborn that need, that we know need to be fixed. For example, <clears throat> the capitalization of Dean through these books.
Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. So that's like that's the first thing that we that we are gonna do is go through and fix all the instances of Dean. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Chapter one. Once a new instructor at the academy would have been the talk of the school for days, but now the Count of Corpses made her unremarkable. Indeed, 
Eben only knew the name parent of the family Arcus because he was to be her pupil. A woman named Lupa had once taught second-year alchemist, but she had perished in the attack upon the High King's seat, falling beneath the blades of the gray and blue-clad warriors who had struck from the west, who some said were called Shades. In the weeks since that battle, Eben was surprised to see how quickly the Academy had resumed its routine, but repetition could not entirely wipe away the memories. Meals were now muted affairs, and students whispered to each other beneath their nervous eyes. Too often, instructors mistakenly called upon students whose seats were empty and classrooms fell to mournful silence. Too often, Eben passed other students in the common room. <clears throat> Tucked into a corner chair, weeping beyond comfort at the loss of a friend. Too often, Eben's thoughts drifted back to the day of the attack and showed him flesh turning to stone beneath his fingers. The High King had tripled the guard upon the seat, and watchfires never ceased their burning in the towers that looked west and east across the Great Bay. The greater part of Se the Selvan army was now stationed upon the island, once that would have filled it to bursting, but now there were many empty buildings to house them. Droves of students had been called home despite the increased guard, their parents no longer confident in the strength of the Academy's granite walls. This despite the fact that the Academy had, been large had largely been untouched in the fighting. Only one other structure had stood so firm, the High King's palace, bloodstained but unbroken. <laughs> I heard that the High King slipped through the shades like a thief in the night and led the escape to Selvan Shores, Caleb murmured. He, Eben, and Theron sat in the nearly silent dining hall, eyeing their food without eating it. The boy's copper hair stuck out in all directions, for he had roused late that morning. Hey, Alex. <clears throat> and the Lord Prince with her thanked the sky, said Eben. He had heard the same tale. These days, rumors flew like wind through the academy halls. It had begun to weary him. He picked at a stain on the table, causing grime to collect beneath his fingernail. Thank the sky, echoed Calum, who seemed not to notice Eben's mood. If you say so, said Theron. She rolled her shoulder and slowly moved her arm in a wide circle. It had been injured in the attack and was only recently free from its sling. Sometimes it still pained her. Yet she could not stop the sacking of the island, and still she has not struck back against Dull Moon. Her flight could be taken for cowardice. Calum's hand tightened to a fist, and he glared at her. You would rather she had fallen in the palace? Then Dalmoon would have won, and there would be no rebuilding now. The Nine Kingdoms would be in chaos. Theron tossed her short bob of hair. She had not renewed its dye in some time, and her dark roots were beginning to show. Dalmoon did win, and do you mean to say that the kingdoms are not already in chaos? Half seemed to waver on the brink of joining the rebellion. If the other kings have no wish for war, that does not make them cowards, nor traitors. <clears throat> Caelum lifted his chin, freckled nose, twitching. And besides, we from Hedgemond have pledged our strength to the High King. Your kingdom sits a half-world away. It could not be farther from the war, said Theron. Not for nothing is Dalmoon's army so feared. If your king shared a border with them, he might not be so eager. I fear the others will join Dalmoon before taking up arms against them. <clears throat> Hiss now, said Eben, stabbing a spoon into his porridge. I grow weary of war talk. But that was not the truth. Eben hated any reminder of the Shade's attack, not because of the carnage they had wrought, but because of his own battle, alone save for Adara on a cliff at the seat's southern shore. Again his mind showed him flesh turning to stone. The porridge soured in his mouth. He had not told his friends the truth of that day. Instead, with Adara's help, he had concocted a well-crafted lie. For how could he tell them that the day the Shades attacked the seat, he had killed the Dean, former Dean, he reminded himself, and his own kin besides. That truth would not go over well with the King's Law nor or the Academy's faculty. Neither, Eben suspected, would his friends find it easy to forgive. What else would you discuss, said Theron? War is all about us. Yet it need not consume our lives, Eben said, and we still have our studies. You know what, I should probably do this on Kindle. That way I can catch any deans that I missed.
Hey, Fallen Clown. Gotta go get my iPad. Da, 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 da.
All right. From the top. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Once a new instructor at the academy would have been the talk of the school for days, but now the Count of Corpses made her unremarkable. Indeed, Evan only knew the name Perrin of the family Arcus because he was to be her pupil. A woman named Lupa had once taught second-year alchemists, but she had perished in the attack upon the High King's seat, falling beneath the blades of the gray and blue-clad warriors who had struck from the west, who some said were called Shades. In the weeks since that battle, Evan was surprised to see how quickly the academy had resumed its routine, but repetition could not entirely wipe away the memories. Meals were now muted affairs, and students whispered to each other beneath nervous eyes. Too often, mis instructors mistake and they called upon students whose seats were empty and classrooms fell to mournful silence. Too often, Evan passed other students in the common room, tucked into a corner chair, weeping beyond comfort at the loss of a friend. <laughs> Too often, Evan's thoughts drifted back to the day of the attack and showed him flesh turning to stone beneath his fingers. The High King had tripled the guard upon the seat, and watchfires never ceased their burning in the towers that looked west and east across the Great Bay. The greater part of the Selvan army was now stationed upon the island. Larger part, two greats in a row. <clears throat> One set would have filled it to bursting, but now there were many empty buildings to house them. Droves of students had been called home despite the increased guard, their parents no longer confident in the strength of the Academy's granite walls, this despite the fact that the Academy had largely been untouched in the fighting. Only one other structure had stood so firm, the High King's Palace, bloodstained but unbroken. I heard that the High King slipped through the shades like a thief in the night, Caleb murmured. He, Eben, and Theron sat in the nearly silent dining hall, eyeing their food without eating it. The boy's copper hair stuck out in all directions, for he had roused late that morning. And the Lord Prince with her, thank the sky, said Eben. He had heard the same tale. These days rumors flew like wind through the academy halls. It had begun to weary him. He picked at a stain on the table, causing grime to connect beneath his fingernail. Thank the sky, echoed Caleb, who seemed not to notice Eben's mood. If you say so, said Theron. She rolled her shoulder and slowly moved her arm in a wide circle. It had been injured in the attack and was only recently free from its sling. Sometimes it still pained her. Yet she could not stop the sacking of the island, and still she has not struck back against all moon. Her flight could be taken for cowardice. Caleb's hand tightened to a fist, and he glared at her. You would rather she had fallen in the palace? Then Del Moon would have won, and there would be no rebuilding now. The Nine Kingdoms would be in chaos. Theron tossed her short bob of hair. She had not renewed its dye in some time, and her dark roots were beginning to show. Del Moon did win. And do you mean to say that the Kingdoms were, are not already in chaos? Half seemed to waver on the brink of joining the rebellion. If the other kings have no wish for war, that does not make them cowards nor traitors. Calum lifted his chin, freckled nose twitching, and besides, we from Hedgemen to pledge our strength to the High King. Your kingdom sits a half-world away. It could not be farther from the war, said Theron. Not for nothing is Dolmoon's army so feared. If your king shared a border with them, he might not be so eager. I fear the others will join Dolmoon before taking up arms against them. Hiss now, said Eben, stabbing a spoon into his porridge. I grow weary of war talk. But that was not the truth. Eben hated any reminder of the Shade's attack. Not, <coughs> not because of the carnage they had wrought, but because of his own battle, alone save for Adara, on a cliff at the seat's southern shore. Again his mind showed him flesh turning to stone, the porridge soured in his mouth. He had not told his friends the truth of that day. Instead, with Adara's help, he had concocted a well-crafted lie. For how could he tell them that the day the Shades attacked the seat, he had killed the Dean, former Dean, he reminded himself, and his own kin besides. That truth would not go over well with the King's Law or the academy fa Academy's faculty. Neither, Evan suspected, would his friends find it easy to forgive. What else would you discuss, said Theron? War is all about us. Yet it need not consume our lives, Evan said. We shall have our stu we still have our studies. Today I shall finally leave Crudell's class behind. And you have my congratulations, said Calum. Almost any instructor would be better than he has been to you. If Lupa were still alive, I should say you would be lucky to fall under her tutelage. Evan fell silent at the mention of Lupa, his eyes cast down. Theron put a hand on his shoulder, but furtively. <clears throat> that should be Evan looking down. As long as we are here, Caleb muttered. He looked at them nervously as though the words had been an accident. What do you mean, said Eben, frowning. Nothing, said Caleb, staring very hard at his breakfast. Theron narrowed her eyes and then reached over to pinch the back of Caleb's neck as though she were a mother cat and he her kitten. Caleb, what troubles you? Tell me now. Ow, Caleb cried out, batting at her hand. Leave me be, witch. Eben leaned forwards. Tell us, Caleb. Caleb sighed and looked at them uneasily. It is nothing. I will make sure it is nothing. It is only my parents wish to bring me home, back to Hedgemond. <clears throat> what, said Eben, eyes widening. You cannot leave. That is what I have told them, said Caleb, and so far they have listened. It is only that, well, after the attack on the seat, they no longer consider it safe.
What, said Eben, eyes widening, you cannot leave. That is what I have told them, said Caleb, and so far they have listened. It is only that, well, after the attack on the seat, they no longer consider it safe. But only the parents of the smallest children are withdrawing them, said Theron scornfully. Then she gave Caleb a sidelong glance. Although now that I think of it, your size... Caleb swung a fist, which she easily blocked. Eben gave her a dirty look. Stop it. She grinned. I am sorry, the temptation was too great. In any case, Caleb continued, still glaring at her, thus far I have managed to convince them I am safe here. Indeed, I feel safer at the academy than I would in my family's own home, what with the war brewing. And does your family agree? <clears throat> For now, at least, said Caleb softly, I am not leaving just yet. I wish others' parents would pull them from the school, muttered Evan. Across the dining hall, Lilith's malicious gaze had caught his eye. Something had changed in Lilith since the attack on the seat. Before, she had seemed to take Evan for a joke and had mocked him with open scorn, but now she seemed truly hateful. He knew not why she despised him so, nor what he could do to mitigate it, and he feared what might come of it if he did nothing. Theron followed his gaze to Lilith, and her countenance grew hard. Turning back, she leaned in close to speak in a low voice. That reminds me, have you heard about the vaults? Eben frowned, but Caleb leaned in closer. I have heard only a rumor. It seems something was stolen from them, said Theron, though we are not yet certain if it was taken during the attack or some time after the students returned to the castle. Citadel. That is like what I heard, said Caleb, but why do you say we? Did you not know? I conduct my servitude in the vaults. Caleb's eyes widened, but Eben raised a hand to stay them both. A moment. As far as I am concerned, you are both speaking in tongues. What servitude, and what are these vaults you speak of? Every student in their sixth year embarks upon servitude in the academy, said Caleb. It is meant to teach us the value of simple work in the service of others. Also, we are paired with advanced wizards with many years of experience so that we may learn from them. And what are the vaults? They are rooms buried deep within the academy's bowels, said Theron. Within them are contained magical artifacts of thousands of years of history. Some predate the academy itself. Eben opened his mouth to ask another question, but Caleb spoke first and eagerly. What was it that the thief stole? An artifact, but which one we do not know, said Theron. I've spent the last several days trying to find out, but I cannot find the records for the room where the theft occurred. What are these artifacts, said Eben? What do they do? <clears throat> Wizards of great power can imbue objects with magical qualities, said Caleb. These can perform small bits of magic even without a wizard's power. Some are little more than baubles, but others, especially older ones, often carry the power of the wizard kings. And that is what made me think of the theft when you were staring your daggers at Lilith, said Theron. You see, she... But just then the bell tolled, signaling the start of morning classes. Theron looked across the dining hall where Lilith was collecting her fishes, dishes for the kitchen. Damn, we should speak more of this, for there is much to tell. This afternoon in the library, she sought to her feet and scooped up her plates with a simple mind spell, suspending them in the air as she weaved their way through the dining hall. The library, but... Oh, poops. Oh, ellipses, why are you such a pain?
else? What else? What else? He and Eben rose more slowly, scooping their dishes up with their hands, but as Eben found his feet in turn, he ran hard into another student, and all their dishes fell to the stone floor together. Sky spat Eben, trying to brush remnants of egg and porridge from his sleeve. Then he looked up and blanched. He stared into the dark eyes of a girl he had met before. He had seen her in his common room on his first day in the academy. When he had tried to befriend her, she had crushed an iron goblet before his eyes. I am sorry, stammered Eben. Why should you be, said the girl, her voice an apathetic monotone. It was an accident. I was behind you anyway. Her eyes glowed and Eben braced himself for a blow, but instead his dishes sprang up from the floor and into his hands while the girls flew into her own. She sauntered off without a word. Eben let out a sigh. Calum snickered beside him. I was afraid you would soil your underclothes. Why are you so afraid of that one? I met her the day I arrived. She was much less friendly then. She crushed a goblet of iron like it was parchment and I thought I saw ill will in her eyes. Calum shrugged. Well, she is a powerful mind mage, and no mistake. Ezra, I believe her name is, but she is not so fearsome as you make her out to be. And after the attack on the seat, I think any ill will between students has fled the Academy's halls. Not so with Lilith. No, I suppose not. They shoveled with the other students towards the kitchens to discard their bowls, and then the assembly passed, muted and mournful, into the halls. Theron joined them outside the dining hall, and just before Evan's <clears throat> and just before Evan left for the first year's classroom, he gave his friends a wan smile. Wan? Wan. Wan smile. Wan. Whatever. Wish me good fortune, he said. You do not need it, said Theron, or if you do, then you should not be graduating in the first place. That is not helpful, Calum said, scowling at Theron. Good fortune, Evan. Chapter 2. Older students peeled away as Evan made his way towards Creedell's class, and the crowd around him grew ever younger. He quite looked forward to having older classmates soon. Creedell's students were all first years, children of 10 or 11. The next class would bring only one year's improvement, but Evan hoped he would look a little less out of place. He reached Cridell's classroom and stepped through the door. The instructor had not yet arrived, but many students had, and in the front row he saw little wild-haired Estrella, the only student in his class to befriend him. She brightened at the sight of him and waved eagerly. He gave her a small smile and waved back, ruffling her hair and making her giggle as he made his way to the back row of benches. <clears throat> More first and second years had been withdrawn from the academy than from among the older children. Australia was one of only six left in the class besides Eben himself. It made him wonder why they did not combine this class and the next into one, but then he realized Creedel would teach him for two years if that were the case, and he shuddered. <clears throat> uh, Creedel arrived at last. He gave the room a quick look, his eyes lingering for a moment upon Evan. Since the attack on the seat, Creedel's fear seemed to have lessened somewhat. Yet still the instructor jumped when Evan spoke too loudly or moved too quickly. Well, uh, class, ahem, said Creedel. Normally I would have you all resume your lessons, but today we have a matter of ceremony we must attend to first. Uh, uh, Evan, would you please approach the front of the classroom? Evan slid down his bench and went forwards, acutely aware of the other students staring at him. Many of them had been there months longer than Evan, and he could feel their awe that he had graduated so swiftly. He wondered if he would have been ready for this first test so quickly if it had not been for Cyrus. Creedel had held forth a wooden rod, careful not to brush Eben's fingers with his own as he handed it over. Eben turned to the class, holding the rod high. He felt the grain of it beneath his fingers, the tiny ridges and valleys in it, of its form. In his mind's eye, he peered into the wood itself, seeing its truest, true nature and the countless tiny parts that composed it. His hand wrapped around Cyrus's ankle, a spark of power within him, flesh turning to stone. He squeezed his eyes shut, shaking his head to banish the images. They faded, but reluctantly. The rod was still wooden. Now Creedel and the students were staring at him expectantly. Evan drew a deep breath through his nose and released it slowly from his lips. He focused on the wood again, and then the room grew brighter, or at least it appeared to, for Evan's eyes were glowing. He saw the wood for what it was, and then he changed it. Pure, simple stone, gray and lifeless and solid, rippled from his fingers. In a moment it was done, and the rod had been turned. Around the room, children reached up to scratch at their necks or shook their heads as though repulsing a fly. Evan knew they could sense his magic, though many of them had not yet learned to use it themselves. Wizards could always, de always detect spells from their own branch or from the mirror branch. Well done, said Creedel, his relief plain. Clearly he was as eager to be rid of Eben as Eben was to leave the class. He reached out and awkwardly patted the boy on his shoulder. Eben returned the rod. With a flourish of his fingers, Creedel turned it back into wood. Class, you have borne witness. Eben has mastered the first test of the transmuter and has moved beyond us. Rise now and let us escort him to his new instructor. The children rose silent and solemn, filing into a line in the room center. Creedel led them into the halls. They passed several doors, the first year classes of the other branches of Mag, before reaching one where Creedel stopped. He tapped out a trio of soft knocks. Boy, I gotta say, <clears throat> um, not to toot my own horn, though there's nothing wrong with tooting your own horn, for the record. Um, uh, this 
book is so much cleaner than most of my other read throughs that went through like th this. It's obvious that I worked on this more before putting it through editing. And it's obvious that this was only ever edited by Karen and like it definitely benefits from that. Do 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 do. <sighs> Come in, commanded a woman's voice, thick and rich and full of power. Creedel nearly dropped <laughs> the rod in fright, so sudden was her call. But he swallowed hard and opened the door. Evan followed him inside. This room had a window overlooking the training grounds, and for a moment the morning's light made Evan blink and shield his eyes. Once they adjusted, he looked about. The room was much the same as Creedel's. Two files of benches stretching from the front to the back, every one with its own desk and a handful of students scattered among them but many bookshelves were lined against the wall with the door filled with thick leather tomes of every description evan was surprised he had not seen any other classrooms with bookshelves he had thought the academy's books were all harbored in its vast library the thought of yet more things to read set his head spinning then evan looked at the front of the room and his heart skipped a beat there behind the lectern was quite simply the most massive woman he had ever seen her soldier, her shoulders, her soldiers, her shoulders seemed to stretch as wide as Evan's arm span, and though the ceiling was at least a pace above her head, her stature made it seem that she might bump against it. Huge hands gripped the lectern's edges and nearly enveloped it, and her dark gray instructor's robe strained mightily to conceal her frame. Her eyes seemed small compared to the rest of her ruddy features, yet they sparkled with interest even when the sunlight missed them. Evan thought this woman looked nothing like a wizard, but rather a mighty warrior of campfire legend, stripped of armor and shrouded instead in cloth, against which her body tried to rebel. This is the new one, then? Well, come in, boy. I am parent of the family Arcus. Let us see. Let let us get your test seen to, for I was just introducing myself to the other students. Uh, uh yes, said Creedel, quaking. Ah, no, we are in the right chapter. <clears throat> quaking as hard as he ever had when confronting Cyrus, the former dean. E Eben, here you are, t t take it. Eben took the wooden rod which Cradell had extended in trembling fingers. He brought it to Perrin and waited. Well, go on, you've done it once already, or should have, before you were brought here. Eben nodded at a loss for words. He turned to the class and held the rod aloft. This time, shock at Perrin's appearance kept his thoughts from drifting to Cyrus. His eyes glowed and the stone rippled along the rod. Good, said Perrin. She clapped her hands and the sound was like thunder. And can you change it back? The blood drained from Eben's face. I... What? No, I only... Oh, calm yourself, said Perrin, waving him off. I only ask from curiosity. It is not a requirement. Now, be seated quickly. Or no, that is not right. Remain here. There is the ceremony, is there not? I forgot about my smart quotes. My smartest quotes. All of my quotes, which are so smart. Okay, how do we do this again? Do, 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 do. Done? Yes? You doing it? Oopa. <laughs> Come on, Scrivener. <laughs> Ooh, hey, for anybody who is uh, who is following um, 
the development of the secret chapter, the secret chapter of Nightblade that was uh, given away as part of the project for awesome. Um, we just got another update in the Facebook group. So do we have a Facebook command? We do not. Unacceptable. Boom. Boom, boom. All right. Oh, thank you, Scrivener. Good, good, good. Okay. <clears throat> oh, she stepped out from behind the lectern, revealing boots that Evan could have fit both feet into and approached Creedel. The craven little instructor quailed as Perrin thrust the rod towards him. Do you vow that you have instructed this pupil to the best of your ability and judgment as well as in skill? I, I so vow, whimpered Creedel, taking the rod. He made a brave but ultimately futile attempt to straighten his shoulders. Do you vow that you will continue his instruction in judgment as well as in skill to the best of your ability? I so vow. Now, as I said, I have scarcely been able to speak to my new students. If you do not mind. Perrin reached out and threw the door open. Then quickly, but not unkindly, she ushered Creedel's class through it. Eben caught one last glimpse of Estrella waving him a happy goodbye before the door shut between them. Well then, find yourself a seat. There are many open benches. Too many, it is a tragedy to say. Sit near the front, for I shall have to work with you first, or else you will no doubt wander like a hatchling without its mother. Eben nodded and made for a seat. One bench in the second row was entirely unoccupied, and he slid into it. Onto it. Perrin returned to the lectern and cleared her throat into a meaty fist. Now then, welcome, uh, what was your name? Eben of the family... He stopped short. He had not meant to mention his family name, but now Perrin was peering at him and he could feel the other student's curiosity at his paws. He gritted his teeth. Of the family Drayden. If Perrin thought anything of it, she gave no sign, though Eben thought he felt several students stiffen. Well then, welcome, Eben. I will say to you what I told the class before your arrival. I do not know you and you do not know me, yet I knew something of your former instructor, Lupa, for she was only a few years behind me when I myself studied here. A good woman, but you were left with me, for which I apologize. You deserve someone wiser, more powerful in transmutation, and certainly a good deal more patient. Those things I cannot promise you, but this I can vow. I will do my best to make of you what I can and help you along your road to knowledge. And I can promise you what the High King Enelin, sky bless her name, has promised us all. I will keep you safe with my every breath. I will serve you to the limits of my power, and I will... A sharp rapping came at the door, and Perrin stopped short. She glowered, hands gripping the lectern tighter for a moment. Come in and be quick! The bark of in her voice made every student in the room jump. The door swung open, and in swept the academy's new dean, Zane of the family Forodar. He was a lank man and pale of skin, with thin black hair hanging down to his shoulders. He was a lank man and sun pale under his dark skin, with thin black hair hanging down to his shoulders. His dark gray robes bore no ornamentation as the former deans had, and yet somehow Zane looked far more impressive in them. It was something in his eyes, Abbott decided. They were haunted, yes, and yet they bore also a steely resolve. Though his frame was slight and could have appeared frail, there was a set to his shoulders that spoke of grim determination. It was a moment before Evan realized that Zane was not alone. Behi beside him was a boy who could not have been more than ten years of age. Evan wondered if he was a new student at the academy until he saw the boy's dark eyes and pinched nose. They were the same as Zane's. He had to be a relation, perhaps even his son. 
Though Perrin had answered gruffly at Zane's knock, she now beamed a warm smile. Good morning, Deed and Fordor. We are honored by your presence. No more than the Academy is honored by yours, Perrin. Instructor Arcus, I mean. Forgive me, my tongue has nearly forgotten the Academy's for courtesies. He stepped forwards and extended a hand. Perrin clasped his wrist firmly, and mine the same, though no great surprise considering the years. Zane nodded and turned to the glass. His tone grew brisk, if not entirely unfriendly. <clears throat> though not entirely unfriendly. Greeting, students. You know who I am, or something of me at least, but I would wager you have had little chance to know your new instructor unless you cannot understand the honor you have been granted. Parent of the family Arcus is as good a woman as I have ever met. I hope you will afford her your utmost attention and your most earnest effort. The dean is far too kind, replied Perrin, stifling a smile, though I will not deny you should heed his advice if ever you wish to pass this class. And who have you brought with you? This cannot be little Aaron. It is, though not so little any more, Zane beckoned the boy forwards. Aaron came timidly, balking at the instructor's great size, but Perrin stooped until she was nearly at eye level with the boy and gravely reached for his hand. It is my pleasure to meet you, young sir, and my heart is gladdened to see you by your father's side again. Aaron smiled bashfully. Thank you, madam. His voice was so soft, Eben could barely hear it from where he sat. I meant not to distract you all, said Zane, his eyes roving the room. I am only showing him about the academy and could not pass without stopping to see you. I expect you... Zane's glance fell on Eben, and there it stopped. He grew rigid as a board, hands tightening to fists by his sides. <clears throat> Eben felt hot blood flooding his cheeks, though he knew not why. You there, said Zane, nearly spitting the words. What is your name? E Eben, Dean Forodar. Your family name, he snapped. The color that had flooded Eben's face drained away at once. I am of the family Drayden, Dean. Dean, capital D. Capital D. Put in that capital D. That capital D. I'm sorry. I'm, I I don't know what what what's happening. I am of a family Drayden Dean. Zane gave no answer, but his hand went to Aaron's shoulder and drew him close as if to shield him. A moment longer he stared, and Eben could not mistake the look in his eye. Hatred, fiery and pure, more so even than Lilith had shown. Then at last Zane turned away. Good day, he said tersely, and swept from the room with his son in tow. Slowly every eye turned to Eben in wonder. Even Perrin gave him a hard look. Eben's gaze fell to his desk, and he stewed in a shame that he did not understand. Oh, Eben... Chapter 3. The rest of the morning class passed quickly, if uncomfortably. Evan tried to pay attention to Perrin, tried to pay attention as Perrin laid out the studies he would need to complete, and he retrieved a book from the shelves at the instructor's command. But though he sat for hours staring at the first page, the words had become a blur before his eyes. He could see only Zane's dark gaze gleaming with unknown malice. When at last the bell rang for midday meal, Evan shot from his bench. <clears throat> but just as he reached the door, Perrin bellowed to stop him. Eben, return your book to its place on the shelf. Eben turned sheepishly to do as he was bid. Several other students had been about to leave their books out as well, but quickly they scrambled to return them. Though he might have imagined it, Eben thought he felt Perrin's careful eye upon him as he returned the book and fled the room. Only then did he break into a run, flying through the citadel towards the dining hall. He found Caleb and Theron standing in the food line and fell into place beside them. He had little desire to eat, but neither did he want to be alone. Something of his mood must have shown in his face, for Caleb frowned in concern. What is wrong? You look as though you woke this morning to find yourself a wizard no longer. Oh, it is no great matter. It is no great matter, said Evan bitterly. Only that the new dean seems to despise me even more than the old one, and just as with Cyrus, I have no faintest idea why. What's it there? An arching an eyebrow. What do you mean? Eben told them all that had happened, doing his best to convey in words the hatred he had felt in Zane's eyes. Caleb shook his head mournfully. That seems ill fortune. I wonder what it is all about, but Theron rolled her eyes. I think you may be imagining things, Eben. It seems far fetched that he could so quickly detest you, though I have no doubt he will learn to once he knows you better. This is no jest, said Aaron irritably. You doubted me when I first you doubted me when I told you of Dean Cyrus's treatment. Do you recall how that turned out? His body still bore the fading bruises from when Cyrus attacked him. As Theron's eyes fell in shame, Eben's guilt grew in response. She felt remorse that she had let Cyrus strike Eben with his mind magic, but she did not know what Eben had done to the Dean on the day of the attack. That secret was his alone, and Adara's, of course. His mood softened at that thought. 
I apologize, Theron said quietly. If you say that is what happened, I believe you. Think nothing of it, Evan muttered, unable to meet her eyes. If Zane indeed has animosity towards you, there must be some reason, said Caleb. I will see if anyone knows what it might be. In truth, I know little of the man beyond the fact he is favored by the High King herself. I shall ask about as well, said Theron, though I do not have as many though I do not have many friends. They had reached the front of the line, so they fetched their food and sat to eat without speaking further. But Eben's appetite had gone from little to nothing, and he could not force himself to swallow more than a spoonful of soup. <clears throat> he gnawed at his bread instead, chewing it over much until it was a soggy mess in his mouth. Theron scooped up the last of her soup, slurping, slurping it noisily, and then shoved the bowl away. A fair meal today. I think they have started cooking better since we returned to the academy, no doubt in an attempt to raise our spirits. Or they are more liberal with their spices since they have fewer mouths to feed, muttered Caleb. Theron snorted and punched his shoulder. Still such dark words. That sounds like something I might say. Here's something I might cheer you. I've changed my schedule. Hereafter, I shall spend my afternoons in the library with you. Caleb grinned. So that is why you said you would speak in the library this afternoon. I had wondered. That is why you said we would speak. Eben, too, found his mood lifted, but then a thought struck him and he frowned. I thought you were no fan of book learning. Of course not, said Theron, pursing her lips. I am not joining you because I wish to study with you, but because I do not want my afternoons to be so incredibly dull. Eben and Caleb stifled groans as they looked sidelong at each other. Eben would be glad for Theron's company, but he enjoyed the peace of his time in the library. Many hours had he and Caleb whiled away, tucked into their armchairs with books of ancient lands and wizard kings. Well, we will certainly enjoy your presence, said Caleb, but Eben could hear that his heart was not in the words. Of course you will, said Theron, and that reminds me, this morning we were speaking of Lilith and of the theft in the vaults. I meant to tell you that someone stopped behind Eben, abruptly enough that their shoes squeaked upon the stones. The vaults. Eben turned. Beside him stood Credel, the thin-faced wheedling instructor wore a vacant look. He turned to them all, his eyes fixed on Theron. The vaults, he repeated. Yes, instructor? She raised her eyebrows. My servitude is in the vaults. What of it? I had almost forgotten. Creedel's voice was absent at customary shake, and his nervous ticks had disappeared. I must enter the vaults. Give me your key. Caleb looked uncertainly at Theron. She met the boy's eyes and gave a barely perceptible shrug. Instructor, I have no key. It is only given to me during my servitude, and only when I must enter the vaults themselves. The vaults, he said, more urgent this time. I must enter them. Give me your key. Now Theron was growing exasperated. I do not have one, she said, very nearly snapping at him. Besides, you are an instructor. If you have academy business within the vaults, you can enter them yourself. Eagle will admit you. I forgot about character lists. Oh, God. Ah. Uh, who do we got? We got Aaron. We got Perrin. <laughs> we got Lupa. Who else have we met that's new? Isra. And we got Eagle. Eagle.
Eagle. No, that can't be right. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom and I'm also going to take a break because I've been going for oh, for an hour now. Be back very soon.
Now Theron was growing exasperated. I do not have one, she said, very nearly snapping at him. Besides, you are an instructor. If you have academy business within the vaults, you can enter them yourself. Aegil will admit you, but I do not have the key. Her last words crackled, and Creedel jumped at last. He blinked twice and then looked down as if noticing Eben at his elbow for the first time. He drew back as if from a viper, wringing his hands just under his chin. Ah, yes, of course, he stuttered. Of course you have no key. Silly of me. I had forgotten. I do not know why Why I thought you... Ah, I am sorry. Good day. He turned and left, winding away through the tables. All three of them kept their eyes fixed upon his back until he was out of sight. That was most odd, said Caleb. Bizarre, agreed Theron. I wonder if he is all right. After the attack upon the seat, I mean. War can break one's mind, they say. He seemed well enough the past few days in class, said Evan quietly. That was unlike I have ever seen him before, and yet not worse. He was less frightened, more sure. Perhaps he is finally growing a spine, Theron shrugged and seemed to... Theron shrugged and seemed to dismiss the matter. In any case, I was speaking of the theft. Of course, said Evan. What news have you? Well, few students perform their servitude in the vaults, uh, but Lilith is another. The both of you, said Caleb. I'm amazed the academy is still standing if the two of you have been in such close quarters so long. Theron glared at him. I can control myself when I wish to, and besides, we are rarely present together. The caretaker, Aegil, almost never requires two students at once. Yes, well and good about all of that, said Evan, waving her words aside, but what of Lilith? What does she have to do with it? I have had a thought brewing, said Theron. Mayhap it was some member of the Academy's faculty who carried out the theft, but it could also have been a student. And if it were a student, who better than one who performs their servitude in the vault? Such a one would know better than any other how to do it. Caelum looked at Eben, his brow creased with doubt. That seems a far reach, Theron. What student would dare risk such a thing? Even Academy faculty might think twice about trying to breach the vault's defenses. Yet many of us are more powerful than our instructors, said Theron. I am stronger than any mind mage here, especially now that Cyrus has vanished. Lilith is at least as, is at least as great as any fire mage on the faculty, though I say that without knowing the new dean's measure. He may be a great fire mage for all I know. Talk of Cyrus had begun to make Eben feel un had begun to make Eben uncomfortable, so he steered the topic away. I hear little evidence beyond it could be so, Theron, and I do not know if even that is true, for Lilith was far away when the attack occurred. How could she have carried out such a theft from another kingdom? She said she left the academy, yes, said Theron, but what if she lied? What better alibi? Eben is right, Caleb said. If that is your only proof, it is flimsy indeed. Theron frowned. It is at least a place to start. To start what? said Eben. She looked at him with wide eyes as though the answer was obvious. Why to find the thief, of course. Caleb gawked. No, no, we are not engaging in another mad scheme, Theron. If the theft is indeed a matter of great worry, then let us... But just then the bell rang, and the dining hall filled with the sound of scraping benches as students stood from their meals. Almost chipper, Theron jumped up to bring her dishes to the kitchen. Caleb growled and followed her. Eben went with them, but he stopped and looked over his shoulder one final time. Creedel stood in the doorway of the dining hall, looking about with a faraway gaze. One hand stole up to scratch at the skin beneath his collar. He shivered as though cold and then vanished into the hallways. It is no matter, thought Evan. You have left his class, and he is no longer your concern. Yet a chill crept up his spine as he followed his friends to the kitchen. Chapter 4 Later in the library, Caleb and Eben introduced Theron to their nook on the third level. Predictably, she seemed to think it boring. She dragged another chair over to join them and draped her feet across the table in their midst.
<sighs> she did that. Uh, Caleb snatched books from beneath her shoes with a scandalized expression, and soon both he and Evan were grinding their teeth as they tried to read, for Theron seemed far more interested in talking. Oh, there was a thing I wanted to check, actually. Yes, very chill day, Wordwin. Ha ha ha. Chapter 4, later in the library, Caleb and Eben introduced... Da, 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 da. And soon both he and Eben were grinding their teeth as they tried to read, for Theron seemed far more interested in talking. Though they tried to give her only short one-word replies and thus dissuade her from speaking, Theron refused to take the hint. Soon, soon Eben found himself at the breaking point. He leapt to his feet and scuttled away towards the bookshelves, muttering something about finding another reference book for a report he was writing for Instructor Gia. Once safely ensconced in the bookshelves and out of earshot of Theron's endless chatter, Eben sighed in relief. Leaning around the shelf's edge, he saw Theron th still going on animatedly to Caleb, while the poor boy shoved his nose very nearly into the spine of his book. I don't think that needs to be italicized. Eben chuckled and ducked out of sight. How heartwarming to see the three of you united in your pursuit of wisdom. The words made Eben jump, but then he recognized Mako's voice. He shot, softly chuckled and turned to find the bodyguard behind him, leaning against one of the shelves. Mako was clad all in black, black shirt beneath an even darker leather vest, and tight leggings that per paraded his wiry muscles. Black, too, were the scabbards at his waist where his long and cruel daggers rested. Mako, it has been some time since last you visited me. Well, war blazes across Underrealm. Mako waved an airy hand. I have been here and there and most places in between. And now you return. To what do I owe the honor? To this, said Mako, reaching within his vest and producing a letter. 
Evan shook his head and took it. He had never fully understood Mako's role within the Drayden family's business, and it still confounded him every time he saw the bodyguard running messages like a simple courier. The letter bore his family's seal, and Evan's heart skipped at the thought that it might be from his father. But no, Shay Drayden had a personal seal. Evan peeled the letter open. Dearest brother, there are not words in all the tongues of the nine lands to describe how angry I am with you. Why is it that the first letter I received from you did not come until the High King's enemies had been invaded the seat? Two months you had to write me a letter, and yet you did nothing. You are an inconsiderate lout and a brute besides. That said, I, that said, I am, of course, so very glad to hear you were not harmed in the fighting, but only one way... But only one way may you retain my good humor towards you. If you write me back at once and without delay, I know nothing of your time at the Academy so far, and it is unbearable. Of course, your letter may very well find me upon the road rather than at home. For yes, we are traveling, dear brother. Even now we make ready to travel to the seat to visit you. Well, we do not come only to visit you, but of course we will visit you while we are there. Are you not excited? It will be wonderful to see your face again, inconsiderate and selfish as you might be. Write me at once, dear Evan. Send it back with Mako if you can, but send it quickly in any case. And be ready to visit me on the seat, for I have a thousand and one questions. With love, Albie. Evan was weeping almost from the moment he recognized his sister's frenetic scrawl upon the parchment, and he laughed with every insult, for he could almost hear the way she would deliver them. Her nose would be scrunched up tight as it was when she grew angry or excited, and her brow would be furrowed, and she would plant her fists on her hips just so, moving them only to brandish them before his nose as if ready to strike him. But though his heart sang at the thought of seeing Albie again, it darkened too at the thought of his family. If the Draydens were returning to the seat, his father would be there as well. Shay had been against Evan's coming to the academy from the first. Might he use the attack as an excuse to withdraw him? Evan turned to Mako. Albie says they are coming to the seat. Do you know when they will arrive? Sometime before year's end, certainly, said Mako. But that is just around the corner. Of course it is. Cruelty lurked in Mako's grin, buried behind an indifference that Evan thought must be feigned. That means they will be able to celebrate the holiday in your company. Perhaps they can even meet your little academy friends, though no doubt there are some other, more private friends you would rather keep hidden. His grin widened. Adar sprang to mind, and Evan felt color in his cheeks. I am surprised they would wish to visit the seat so soon, he said, changing the subject for his own benefit as much as Mako's distraction. Many think it dangerous here. Some parents are even bringing their children home. The attack upon the seat was a tragedy, no doubt, as you say, but that begs the question, how did you learn of it in time to warn me? Mako shifted on his feet, uncrossing and recrossing his arms through a moment of silence. How do you think I learned of it, little Eben? Eben felt his pulse quicken and his breath came shallow. Was it someone in our family? Mako snorted. A Drayden? No. This may shock you, Eben, but I have friends outside our clan. Did you hear of it from someone in our family? <clears throat> Drayden? No, this may shock you, Evan, but I have friends outside our clan. Well, I say friends, of course, though they might not agree, but in any case, brigands and ne'er-do-wells are of a kind, and through us news may travel from one end of Underrealm to the other, faster than a bird's flight. That was not quite an answer, Evan realized. Did the family Drayden have aught to do with the attack, he pressed. I, just before that day, Cyrus confronted me in a rage. He seemed to think Halab... He seemed to think our kin were plotting. If he spoke those words, then he was a fool in truth, said Mako vehemently. For years I called him scum and untrustworthy. Halab would not listen. She tried so hard to see the good in him when I knew there was only pettiness and selfishness and greed, mayhap even a touch of madness. Eben thought of when Cyrus attacked him in the garden, and a phantom pain flared into his ribs. Then his thoughts went to their battle on the cliffs, and he shuddered. You may be right about that, he murmured. To accuse Halab was to prove his ignorance. There are reasons for that, <clears throat> which I cannot explain now, though perhaps the day approaches when I shall. Your father, on the other hand, he trailed off, and when Eben looked up, he saw the man regarding him with a keen glint in his eye. What of him? He was the one who had me deliver the parcel to that inn upon the seat. Are you saying that played some role in the assault? Mako laughed, but softly, for they were still in the library. Your question is absurd, not because of its premise, but because you think I would tell you if you were correct. That is no answer. It is not meant to be. Mako pursed his lips at Eben's scowl. Oh, very well, enough games. You wish for more certainty? Then think upon what you know. Cyrus was a madman, quite useful to the family, yes, yet prone to baseless fears of being undermined. Then he was lying. The family Drayden had an agent at the height of power within the academy. The dean has the ear of the high king herself and a place upon her council. Would your father leave such a resource upon the seat to die? His dark grin returned. You, mayhap, he would allow to perish, but not Cyrus. Very well, Eben muttered. I believe that, not for your words, but for the truth you speak of my father. Mako gave a mocking bow. You are too gracious, little gold bag. Eben felt as though a great weight had lifted from his shoulders. If the Draydens had no hand in the attack, then he had played no part by delivering that parcel for his father. But with that worry removed, Eben's thoughts ran to a more pressing concern. 
I must ask you something else, said Evan. What do you know of the Academy's new dean, the replacement for Cyrus? The bodyguard's countenance darkened, his upper lip curling in a snarl. That meddlesome fool. You would do well to stay away from him. That choice may not be mine. He has seen me already, and from the moment our eyes met, I felt that he hated me. His malice was like a physical thing, reaching out to grip my throat. Mako snorted. How poetic. Yet if I were there, I might not doubt your words. Zane of the family Forodar is much cause to f hate the family Drayden. And as it happens, your woes with this dean stem from his troubles with the former. Eben blinked. With Cyrus? What is he to do with this? Everything. You know the dean spends much time within the High King's court. Upon a time, Zane was often in that court as well. Always they were at odds, for both were powerful wizards of mirror branches, and Zane always gave counsel against Cyrus's advice. They had been rivals even from their academy days, yet it was not until they were both grown that their rivalry blossomed into violence invited by Zane's own arrogance. <clears throat>
Everything. You know the Dean spends much time within the High King's Court. Upon a time, Zane was often in that court as well. Upon a time, Zane was often in that court as well, along with another mind mage of our clan, a man named Driston, who you would never have met. Always Driston and Zane were at odds, for both were powerful wizards of mirror branches, and Zane always gave counsel against Driston and his advice. They had been rivals even from their academy days, yet it was not until they were both grown that their rivalry blo blossomed into violence, invited by Zane's own arrogance. There was a duel, a wizard's battle. Driston received aid from Cyrus and another still more powerful wizard. When the duel was finished, someone lay badly hurt, but it was neither of the contestants. Zane's magic spun out of control, striking a bystander with no stake in the fight. The victim was a distant kin of the High King herself. The blood drained from Eben's face. That is no small crime. No, indeed. Constables and mystics pursued Zane from the seat and, all ac and across all the nine lands. <clears throat> but now, for reasons beyond understanding, the High King herself has pardoned him. Something to do with this war that now engulfs Underrealm, though I have not learned any more though I have not learned any details. And now that he is ensconced in power again, he hates the family dragon. He blames us for his own failures, his own weakness. Therefore, thus, if you have earned his ire, I warn you, hide. He is an eagle and you are a mouse. Do not provoke him. Do not even speak with him if you can help it. I have no wish to spend any more time with him than I must, said Eben, shivering. But he was thinking of Zane and Cyrus in their duel. What might Zane think if he knew Eben had killed Cyrus in the end? But now Maka was looking at him keenly, and he forced himself into a steady calm. But this is an unreasoning cause for hate. I am not Cyrus. What happened to Zane had nothing to do with me. Maka shrugged. You are a Drayden, even if not by your choice. Every great family has some dark deeds to their name, and your best intentions do not pardon the actions of your kin. Eben sagged against the bookshelf, his head lolling back to strike the leather spines. Another dean whose hatred of him he could neither explain nor hope to alleviate. His life seemed a sad mockery, a jester's play, his hands clenched at his sides. Mako, for his part, seemed to be re reveling in Eben's discomfort. He smiled again and then straightened. Well, I came only to deliver a letter. Now I must be on my way. Unless you wish to reply to Alby, it would take me time. I will send it by regular courier. I am grateful for the letter and for the truth about Zane. It was my pleasure, truly, said Mako with a flash of his teeth. But then his eyes drifted past Eben and he grew somber. As for your other question about the attack on the seat, you know the Draydens are not the only wealthy family in Underrealm. He nodded, his gaze still fixed on something over Eben's shoulder. Eben turned. There, a few shelves away, was Lilith, half hidden by gaps in the books. Eben turned quickly to Mako. Are you saying Yaren was behind the attack? Mako shrugged. I know nothing for certain, only it seems unlikely that Dalmoon and the Shades could have staged such an invasion without the coin of a great merchant house. I will say this. If Halab commanded me to investigate the attack, that is where I would start my search. And Theron had believed that Lilith might be behind the theft in the vaults. Mako turned as if to leave, but Eben reached out and gripped his arm. It felt like iron. Mako glanced down at Eben's hand. Eben gulped, trying to hide it. <clears throat> Thank you. I never said that after you saved my life. I have not yet had the chance to say that after you saved my life. I may owe you the very beating of my heart, along with the lives of my friends. I have not always thought highly of you, but I see now that that was my mistake. Mocker looked almost startled, which in turn surprised Eben. The bodyguard rarely showed anything other than contempt and condescension. But his wide grin slid, black, slid back into place after only a moment, and he flicked two hands, fingers in dismissal. That is no mistake on your part. Few think highly of me, especially among the wise. And if I saved the lives of some within the academy, well, then it was an accident. I had only hoped that you would be around a bit longer, at least. You are so amusing, after all. He stepped around the corner of the bookshelf and vanished. Chapter 4, Din!
Chapter 5. Evan returned to Caleb and Theron in their alcove against the wall. Caleb appeared to have given up trying to read and was leaning back with his chin in his hand, listening to Theron as she went on about some new spell she was trying to master. They both looked up at his approach. Thank the sky, said Caleb. It is my turn to go and look for a book. What do you mean, said Theron, frowning? You cannot tell me the two of you do not enjoy my company. I've changed my entire class schedule for you. Theron, I come, I come here to read, not to speak, said Caleb. She seemed about to reply until she looked up and saw the concern in Evan's face. Evan, what is it? Evan glanced up at her and then over his shoulder where he had been speaking with Mako. He shifted on his feet the letter from Alby crinkling, crinkling in his hand. Uh, my family is coming to the seat, he said, holding the parchment aloft. Both his friends grew solemn. Well, that is a pleasant surprise, Caleb said with visible effort. Oh, do not be an idiot, Caleb, said Theron. When will they come? Some time before years end. But in fact, that is not what troubles me. He sank into a chair between them, his mind racing at how he might tell them without revealing Mako's involvement. I've been thinking on what you said before about Lilith being the thief who robbed the Academy vaults. Yes, said Theron, sitting straighter. Do you believe me now? Let us say that I did, said Evan. What would we do about it? What, what do you know of Lilith? Theron frowned. What makes you think I know anything of her? She is a gold bag like any other. Well, besides the two of you, perhaps. Mayhap. Forgot about my mayhaps in this book. Well, besides the two of you, mayhap. Evan rolled his eyes. I mean, how might she have done it? Where might she have hidden what she stole? Caleb spoke before Theron could answer. I do not understand, Evan. Why have you changed your mind so suddenly? Just this morning you agreed with me that there was little evidence pointing to Lilith. I have been considering the possibility, Evan said, hearing Mako in his mind, and I think it is unlikely that Dolmoon would risk open war against the High King, even with the Alliance of these Shades, or whoever they are, unless they also had the support of one of the great families, a royal family for your strength of arms, or of a merchant family for the depth of our purses. 
But there are dozens of merchant families across Underrealm, said Caleb. Few have purses deep enough for a civil war, said Theron, leaning forwards and ex forwards. Leaning forwards in excitement. Only Drayden or Yaren could do it, and Yaren removed their children from the seat during the attack while you and Cyrus stayed here. I think I see your mind, Evan. Calum shook his head. All of this is still only conjecture, and I ask you both again, even if you are right, what do you mean to do about it? To expose her, said Evan, leaning forwards. Think of it. If we can prove the Yarens had something to do with the attack and the theft within the vaults, they would face the High King's justice. I'm going to replace the Kindle file again just because otherwise I'm going to see a lot of errors that aren't actually errors. See, these are the sorts of deals that I was hoping to find during this. Because this is the first book Karen ever edited. And uh, stuff like Mayhap wasn't actually in my style sheet. Same with Forwards and Towards. Okay. <clears throat> to expose her, said Evan, leaning forwards. <laughs> Didn't think about that.
to expose her, said Evan, leaning forwards. Think of it. If we can prove the Yarens had something to do with the attack and the theft within the vaults, they would face the High King's justice. Dalmoon would lose a powerful ally and be forced to surrender before this war has truly begun. Does your loyalty towards the High King not demand this of you? He thought he might have convinced Caelan, for the boy paused with a frown, but when he finally answered, he was angrier still. No, this is a mad scheme. Where do you even get such thoughts, Evan? And do not tell me they came from that letter. I've been thinking on this, as I said, Evan muttered. I can see the lie in your eyes, Evan. I've seen it there before. Can you not even trust me with the truth? Now even Theron was looking at Evan askance, so he sighed and looked away uneasily. Very well. When I went to fetch a book just now, I was visited by Mako, my family's bodyguard, of whom I have spoken of before. Here? said Caleb, his voice shrill. In the library? In the academy? How did he enter? I do not know. He seems to come and go as he wishes. Has he been here before? said Caleb, nearly shouting. Now Evan was growing angry. Yes, and somewhat often. What of it? Mayhap Cyrus permitted it, and he has heard no different from Zane. Or mayhap he knows a way in and out of these walls that no one else is privy to. What matters is not how he came to tell me, but what he said. Theron seized Evan's knee, gripping it tight enough to make him wince. Did he tell you Lilith had something to do with the attack upon the seat? Evan looked away uncomfortably. He... Not exactly. It is rarely so plain with him, but he did say that if he were to investigate the attack and the theft in the vaults, he would begin to search with the family Yaren. She released his knee, but only to slap his leg. Evan grunted and rubbed at the spot. I knew it, Theron hissed, her voice shaking. She must have used her time in the vaults to scour the records for the artifact her family wanted. In exchange for helping Dalmoon in their assault, they would have access to any artifact they desired within the vaults. Her family must be putting her up to it. Understand that Mako did not say any of this, said Evan. It is only a theory for now, and we must carefully consider our steps before taking them. Only a theory, you say, but I am certain of it. It was a Yaren plot set in motion months ago. Yet what would they earn from this, Evan asked. Do we believe they would risk the fall of an entire kingdom for a handful of magical trinkets? Some of those trinkets hold power beyond reckoning, said Theron, and what does Yaren care if the kingdom of Dalmoon should stand or fall? They are not royalty. Their business will go on, and their wealth will accumulate as it has for countless generations. Very well, said Evan. If we consider ourselves correct in that Lilith was the thief, what now? How can we prove it and expose the Yarens? We could follow her. Evan and Theron went still, staring at Caleb in amazement. He met their wondering looks with tight pressed lips and eyes smoldering in anger. I'm surprised to hear that from you, Caleb, Evan said carefully. Are you? said Caleb. If it is true, and if your family spy says it might be, mayhap we should listen, then Lilith must pay. All the Yarens must. How many empty chairs are in the academy? How many lecterns require new instructors? And if the invasion was a tragedy, the coming war will be far, far worse. If the bl if blame for that may be laid at Yaren's feet, then let it be laid and let them pay the price. Theron snorted, but Evan could see admiration in her eyes. You sound like one of the kings you scorned earlier, eager for war. Caleb shook his head. I have no wish to fight, he said more quietly now. I only want proof. If we can get it, then let us do so, but in secret and without recklessly endangering ourselves. Then we can take what we have learned to the Academy's faculty or mayhap to the constables. Let them deal with the criminals. If we can do that, well, then mayhap my parents will no longer wish to bring me home. They all fell silent. Then Eben rested a comforting hand on Caleb's shoulder. No doubt you are right. If all of us, if we are all of us resolved, we should start immediately. We shall follow Lilith's steps outside the class as close as her shadow. If Yaren should plot against the Academy again, we three will be the first to know. They spent the rest of their afternoon in studious silence. Theron even stopped trying to speak to Eben and Caleb while they read. But when the day's final bell tolled, they stacked their books upon the table and made quickly for the halls. Eben tried to spot Lilith on their way out, but either she left as soon as the bell rang or she was lost somewhere in the crowd. Only moments passed, however, before Theron summoned them with a sharp whistle. There was Lilith, heading towards the dormitories. Her lackeys, Orin and Ella, had joined her from, her class, from their classes, and the three of them walked in step. Evan and Caitlin moved to close the gap between them, but Theron gripped their arms. <clears throat> 
Not too close, she said, bringing her mouth to their ears to be heard above the crowd. We do not want them to think we are following. Once Lilith reached the stairs, she led the others up. The other older students' dormitories were nearest the bottom, so they left the staircase almost at once to enter the common room. While Lilith went to her dormitory, Orn and Nella remained behind to keep watch. What do you suppose she is doing in there, whispered Theron. Nothing good, I feel, said Eben. If she does not emerge in a moment or two, one of us should sneak. But then Lilith reappeared in the doorway, and the words died on his tongue. She had changed from her plain black student's cloak to a finer one trimmed in dark green, green brocade. He'd never before seen her in specially tailored student robes. Indeed, he would have thought it was against the rules. <sighs> Lilith swept past Nella and Orin, who hastened to follow in step behind her. Eben and his friends followed all the way back to the library, where she swept in through the wide doors. I've never thought that Lilith was the studious, studious type, said Eben, and if she is studying, why should she go to change, go to change her cloak? Do you, do you wish to wait here and wonder? Only one thing will reveal the truth. And so saying, Theron pushed through the library doors. Eben and Caleb traded a final worried look before running behind her. Inside it was silent. Only a handful of students were in view, puttering about the shelves with candles or lanterns now that the sun was fading from the skylight above. There, Caleb pointed, and Eben's gaze followed. He saw a number of students sitting near the library's rear, and Lilith was among them. Let us get closer, said Theron. They stole off to the right so they could wend their way through the shelves towards the gathering without being seen. As they drew near, they slowed their pace until they were moving a little faster than a crawl. At last, they stopped beneath, behind a thick shelf and leaned around the corner to watch. About a dozen students had gathered to meet with Lilith. They had arranged armchairs into a circle with some table set about for refreshments, cheese and bread, and many flagons of wine. They spoke lightly and laughed often, drinking freely. Eben noticed it noted that some already had ruddy cheeks and noses. He could catch snatches of conversation, of lessons learned and spells mastered, of which instructors were kind and which, inst and which cruel. But Lilith was silent and cold, positioned as if, that, as if at the head of an invisible table, and her eyes were grave as they stared into nothing. What is she brooding on, wondered Eben. More to the point, why, what is this gathering all about, said Caleb. Why would they meet in the library if not to study? Not everyone enjoys books as much as you and Eben, Caleb, said Theron. Eben looked around about the room with a frown. No, he is right. If they do not wish to study, they could meet in the city. There are inns and taverns aplenty with better refreshments than they have here. So why the library? Theron's brow furrowed, but after a moment, Caleb snapped his fingers. What else might they find in a tavern? Eben blinked. I know not what you mean. Noise? Distraction? Near enough to the point. Other people. Whatever they are discussing, they do not wish to be overheard. But that is silly, said Theron. There are other students here in the library. Sky above. We are here and we can hear and can hear them. We came looking for them and can only hear their words because we were eavesdropping. Who else would be here now except students who enjoy learning more than an evening spent with friends? Bookish children, as you might call us, Theron. And look, none of those will draw within a stone sore of this gathering of merchant children and nobles who bully them. <clears throat> Eben looked. Eben looked and saw that Caelan was right. Some students there were indeed, pulling tomes from the shelves to study by candlelight, but they all steered well clear of Lilith's party. If he had happened to be here for other, more innocent purposes, he would have done the same. As if in answer to Caleb's words, Lilith stood abruptly to her chair. The other students went silent after a moment, looking up at her expectantly. We must invite more to this gathering, she said. The gold bag society must grow. We will reach out to every merchant child, every royal son and daughter. Hear, hear, said one of the students, raising her goblet with a prim smile, though I am nearly scandalized to hear you use that uncouth term, gold bag, honestly. Such a weak word, if truly they mean it as an insult. Surely you do not mean everyone, Lilith, said Orin with a nasty grin. Not that Drayden whelp, at least. He gave an... He gave a laugh and looked around. The other students tittered in approval, but Lilith fixed him with a steely gaze. Every merchant's child, every royal son and daughter. Orin's face fell. Even Eben? 
every merchant's child. The Goldbag Society must grow. We must invite more students to this gathering. All right, Lilith, we have heard you, said Nella. She shook her head with a weak smile. Sit and drink. You are drawn tight as a Kalentin bow. Lilith shuddered, shaking her head as she placed a hand to her brow. Yes, yes, very well. Only do not forget. She took her seat again and gratefully accepted the wine that Nella pressed to her pressed to her before leaning back into her cushions. Eben turned to the others. Caleb's face was scrunched up as he peered at the gathering, but Theron had gone stony, her hands balled into white-knuckled fists. Every child of merchants and royalty, is it? said Theron. Such petty, small-minded revenge. How very like her. What do you mean, said Eben. Theron tossed her head. Do you not see Eben? She is forming this little gathering of children with wealth and power. Sky above, she is even willing to mend her bridges with you. And why? I know not, said Eben, frowning. I myself have no wish for such a mending. Of course not. Yet she aims to beguile you, because one day you will rule over your family in its deep reserves of coin, as Lilith will rule hers. What an alliance that could be. And if she sat at the head of your group of academy friends, well, think how amenable you might be to any favor she might ask. I would never do her any favors, nor would I join this little cabal, Eben insisted. As I have said already, I know you would not, said Theron. I am angry at Lilith, not you. Think. She knows we three dislike her. We have confronted her in the past, and what does she think of to solve this problem? Division, seducing the two of you while leaving me, while she leaves me out in the cold. You may overestimate our importance, mumbled Caleb, eyes at his feet. I would be surprised to know that Lila thinks much of us at all, let alone enough to concoct such a scheme as that. Neither of you has known her as long as I, said Theron darkly. Look, said Eben, pointing. Where is she going? Lilith had stood and begun to move away, but when Orin and Nella were made to rise with her, she waved them down. I must use the privy, she said, and swept off, drawing her black cloak tight. Her steps were brisk and clipped, and she stopped only once to look back over her shoulder when she reached the library doors. Eben shared a look with his friends. The privy, she says? I doubt it, said Theron. Let us go. But do you not think... Oh, never mind, grumbled Caleb, for they had started off without him. <clears throat> By the time they reached the hallway, Lilith had almost vanished, but they spied her just before she turned a corner. They hastened to follow down another two halls, but when Lilith reached the turn to the privy, she passed it by. Again, Eben, Kaelin, and Theron looked at, shared a silent look before running behind her. She reached one of the white cedar doors that led out and then glanced down the hallway and, and then again glanced down the hallway in both directions. Eben and his friends were only saved because Lilith looked the other way first, for they dove into an alcove before she could turn back to see them. Once they heard the door swing shut, they ran after her again. The night air outside was wonderfully cold upon their cheeks, for inside the citadel, Eben had begun to sweat beneath his cloak. Snow had, be Snow had yet to fall, and so they could keep their steps silent upon the soft grass as they followed Lilith deep into the academy's training grounds. She took an odd path, weaving through bushes and hedges, first one way and then another. Has she seen us following her? said Caleb. I do not think so, for still she moves slowly, said Theron. She could be lost, but more likely she is taking precautions. Oh, I just forgot I needed to do a thing. Do a thang, do a thang, do a thang. Back.
<sighs> uh, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I didn't even realize we passed the two-hour mark some time ago. Be right back.
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. All right, ninety more minutes before I go break for lunch. She reached one of the white cedar doors that led outside and then glanced down the hallway, and then again glanced down the hallway in both directions. Heaven and his friends were only saved by the, because Lilith looked the other way first, for they dove into an alcove before she could turn back to see them. Once they heard the door swing shut, they ran after her again. The night air outside was wonderfully cold upon their cheeks, for inside the citadel, Evan had begun to sweat beneath his cloak. Snow had yet to fall, and so they could keep their steps silent upon the soft grass as they followed Lilith deep into the academy's training grounds. She took an odd path, weaving through bushes and hedges, first one way and then another. Has she seen us following her, said Caleb? I do not think so, for still she moves slowly, said Theron. She could be lost, but more likely she's taking precautions. But even as he spoke, Lilith turned the corner of a great hedge and broke into a run, her steps fading toward silence. Go, said Evan. They sprinted for the end of the hedge and came into the open. Lilith was nowhere to be seen. Split up, hissed Theron. She ran off. Theron, said Evan. He could follow her, but it would be a waste. He ran straight, and Caleb scampered to stay at his heels. How do you know she went this way, said Caleb? I do not, growled Evan. I am hoping. Hedges formed us into a sort of maze at this part of the garden, but they could see a fair distance in every direction. Evan thought he could hear running footsteps around every corner. Whenever he wondered if they were only in his mind, they came again, and Caleb would seize the sleeve of his robe. Then they would run pell-mell to catch up, only to hear the steps fade and vanish again. Darkness take her, said Evan. She must know we are here. Hold, said Caleb, gripping his arm. They went deathly still. Footsteps on the other side of the hedge continued, then Peter did nothing. Caleb met Evan's eyes in the moonlight. The boy's eyes were wide and frightened, but then Evan guessed that he must look much the same. <clears throat> the boys were wide and frightened. They crept along. Evan stepped slow and soft as if... He heard one sharp step on the other side of the hedge. It sounded like a stumble. He met Caleb's eyes and received a nod. Lilith was sneaking along beside them. Then they heard murmuring voices from the other direction. <sighs> Evan whirled. Caleb barely stifled a cry, and from the other side of the hedge came the sound of running. Lilith was trying to free, taking advantage of the distraction. Catch her, Evan whispered. I think I can... Caleb's eyes began to glow. He stepped forwards. He stepped towards the hedge and held forth his hand. Where he touched the shrub, it hissed and vanished into steam. Leaping forwards, he cleared a tunnel through the plants, only for Evan to hear him give a muffled cry from the other side. Caleb! Evan barely kept his voice muted and bound forwards through the brush. <clears throat> Bounded forwards through the brush. On the other side were two dark figures. He flung himself at the taller one, tackling it to the ground. Get off me, you idiot gold shitter, hissed a familiar voice. Theron, said Evan, for indeed it was her. He pushed up and away, holding out his hands. I, I am sorry, I did not know. Leave it, she growled, and help me up. He hastened to take Theron's hand and pull her, pull her to standing. We heard you and thought it was Lilith. I heard you and thought you were Lilith. When I heard those voices, I thought she was trying to escape. The voices. Evan waved at his friends for silence. Together they crept towards the gap in the hedge that, hedges that Caleb had created. The voices were still there, two of them, both hushed. That must be Lilith, whispered Caleb. I and one other sit there, and it is a good thing they did not hear us, said Evan. Now if we see now if we can see who but there came rustling steps on the grass, and the trio threw themselves behind a rose bush. Lilith emerged from the garden into the moonlight. Her eyes were fixed straight ahead and her steps were steady. Had she glanced to her left, she might have seen Evan, but she did not waver on her way back to the citadel. After her, said Theron, in a moment, said Evan. First I would like to know who she spoke to. Her accomplice means nothing. We are not follow we are following Lilith. It will be but a moment. Evan did not wait for an answer, but slipped around the rose bush and into the hedges. Here the plants formed a sort of fence around a small yard with two stone benches. Evan had come here on occasion when he wished to be alone with his thoughts. He reached a narrow gap in the hedge, pressing himself up against it to peer inside. He could see no one. <clears throat> Eben turned to find Theron and Caleb eyeing him expectantly. He frowned, shaking his head. Theron pushed past him to see for herself. Theron, wait! Eben grabbed for her sleeve, but she cast him off. Evan flinched as she stepped into the open, but nothing happened. Slowly, he straightened and joined her. No one was there. The benches were empty. Who was she talking to? Caleb asked. They must have slipped away, muttered Theron. Our eyes were on upon the door the whole time, said Eben. They could not have left without us seeing it. Theron snorted. This is the Academy, Evan. A were mage could have turned into a snake and slithered away. A mind mage could leap over the hedge. A fire mage. A child's piercing scream rang out from the citadel, cutting her words short. Shock froze them. Then Evan cried Lilith and ran while the others hastened to follow. Together they burst through the white cedar door and flew through the halls <coughs> towards the screams that grew louder and more terrified the closer they drew. 
We make for the vault, said Theron as they ran. Something has happened. Lilith must. They rounded the final corner and froze, struck dumb at the sight before them. In front of a great iron door lay Instructor Creedel. His eyes were no longer anxious and shifting, but vacant and staring up at the ceiling as blood spilled from his slit throat to pool around his body. Dun dun dun! Da da dun! Chapter 6. For a moment, Eben could see nothing but the body. Creedel's face was elf-white, marked only by the dark blood that had spattered his skin as it spurted forth. That blood ran thick and slow now, soaking into his hair and robes. Eben thought of the day the seat was attacked and that Creedel had been bloodstained then, too, fighting to defend his students from the shades in an uncommon display of courage. His students. Astrea. Darkness take me, thought Eben. For there she was, little Astrea, cowering against the wall. She was screaming, still screaming, and he realized it had been her voice that they had heard from the garden. Her feet scraped the floor and her hands dragged at the stone walls, though she wished to burrow into it in a way, but she could not remove her eyes from Creedel's brawled on the floor. Another student stood beside her, holding her in a tight embrace. Isra, the girl he had run into in the dining hall that morning. She held Estrella tight, her face to the her face held to the girls, whispering comfort into her ear. Some other students stood about as well, drawn by the commotion just as Eben and his friends had been, but all, like Eben, were frozen in fear. He forced himself to move, crossing the hallway toward th Did I really? Thought I fixed this. He forced himself to move, crossing the hallway towards Estrella. He knelt before her, placing his face in between her and Creedel's corpse. Estrella! Estrella! She stopped her screaming long enough for her wild eyes to find his. It took a moment for her to recognize him, but when she did, she flung herself forwards, wrapping her arms around his neck. He turned so her face was pointed away from he turned so her face was pointed away from Creedel. But then to his surprise, Ezra reached out to drag Estrella backwards. She knelt to hold the girl. Her eyes were wide, her face even more gaunt and pinched than usual. Estrella gripped her hard, tears soaking the older girl's robes. What happened, said Theron. For a moment, Ezra seemed unable to speak, only looked up and only looking up and blinking. At last, she shook her head and stuttered. We, we were walking together, the two of us. We found him here like this. Who else was here, said Theron. Was it Lilith? Did you see her? Evan frowned. Theron. Ezra only blinked, still in shock, and her hands tightened on Estrella's shoulders. What is going on here? Stand aside, all of... Oh, sky above. Back, back. 
They turned to find Gia. Her light skin had grown paler still, and she stood before the students, waving them back from the body. Instructor Dasko arrived a moment later. He stared at the body a bit longer than Gia had, but then he joined her in ushering the students away. Sky above, Eben, get that child out of sight of him. Gia's sharp rebuke jarred him from his thoughts. Crimson blush crept into his cheeks that he had not thought of it. Quickly, he went to Estrella, guiding her down the hallway. Ezra kept a tight grip on the girl's shoulder, but she did not stop him. They stopped around the corner where Estrella collapsed to the stone floor. Ezra sat beside her, one arm still wrapped protectively about the girl's shoulders. Heavy thudding footsteps sounded down the hall, and Perrin came into view a moment later. She caught Eben's eye and tossed her head. What is all this commotion for? Eben pointed down the hall. It, Instructor Creedel, he is, they found him. Perrin's he face grew solemn and she broke into a heavy jog. Though she vanished around the corner, Eben could still hear the sharp hiss of her breath when she saw Creedel. Then her booming commands rang forth, ordering students to draw away from the body so the instructors could do their work. Are you all right? Eben winced at once, wondering how foolish the question, hearing how foolish the question sounded. Would you like some water or anything else from the kitchens? I could fetch something. But Estrella only shook her head, eyes fixed sightlessly upon her feet. Theron drew close and pulled Caleb in as well. It was Lilith, she murmured. It must have been. She slipped away from us so she could do this. I knew we should have followed her. Murdering an instructor, said Caleb? That is madness. She could not. And besides, why would she? The vaults, of course, said Theron, frowning. Did you not see the door where Credell lay? That is the entrance. Caleb balked, sharing an uncertain look with Evan. But dark, clipped footsteps... But sharp, clipped footsteps down the hallway distracted them, and they all turned to see Gia approaching. She swept her gaze across them, lips pursed. Did anyone see what happened? No instructor, said Evan. Estrella shook her head. Who arrived first? Them. Estrella and Ezra, I mean. Or at least they came before we did, said Theron. But instructor, in the garden we saw... Gia silenced her with a raised finger and then went to kneel before Estrella and Ezra. She took the girls, she took the younger girl's hands in her own, pressing them gently together. Estrella, she said softly, it pains me greatly that you saw that. I'm sorry to ask, but it may help us. Did you see anything? Anything at all that might help? <clears throat> Estrella shook her head, eyes still saucer wide. Ezra gripped her tighter. We were together, instructor, walking through the hall. We found him just as you saw him. Is that true, Estrella? The girl nodded. Gia sighed and stood. Thank you both. Isra, please, please see Estrella to her dormitory and wait with her in the common room until I can visit you. Do you understand? Isra nodded and stood, but before she could leave, Theron sprang forwards to take Gia's sleeve. Instructor, she said quickly, we may have seen something that could help. Moments before we heard Estrella scream, we were following Lilith in the gardens. She spoke with someone out there, though we could not see who. Then she eluded us, vanishing from sight. It was only moments later that they found Credel's body. Why were you following her? Gia frowned. Why were you following her? What do you mean she eluded you? She snuck away. She stepped out of sight so that we could not follow her. Eben had grown more uncomfortable with Theron's every word, and now he took her by the arm. Theron, that is not exactly what happened. Instructor, we were following Lilith, but she did not know it, and she did not try to evade us. She went into the academy while we stayed behind. Theron's eyes upon him were full of fury and hurt. But it was before Credel was killed, she insisted. Gia glared, folding her arms across her chest. Theron, I know something of the feud between you and Lilith, but accusing her of murder is far beyond reason, even for you. Unless you have something more substantial than this. I have not accused her, cried Theron. I have only told you what I saw. Is it not at least worth questioning her? A little more than any other soul at the Academy, said Gia. Many were surely alone when... Abruptly, she stopped talking and drew up straight, folding her hands together before her. Eben felt a presence behind him and turned, along with Caleb and Theron. There stood Dean Zane, Dean Foradar. imposing in his robes of office, his dark eyes fixed on Eben. Son of Drayden, he said, his voice dripping with scorn, I am not surprised to find you present in such a commotion. Dean, said Gia gravely, Instructor Creedel has been found dead. I will show you the body. Dasko and Perrin have cleared the students out of the hall. That gave him pause, but only for the space of a breath. Did any witness what happened, said Zane, never taking his eyes from Eben. Were you there, son of Drayden? Fear mixed with anger in Eben's breast, fear of Zane's reckless malice and anger at the injustice of it. No, Dean, I was in the garden with Theron and Caleb. Zane looked to Eben's friends. Theron nodded, and Caleb said, It is true, Dean. Several other students reached the body before Eben and his friends, Dean, Gia added. We had just begun to question the students when you arrived. Zane looked at her and then to Ezra. Zane looked to her and then to Ezra, who met his gaze with one of equal steel. He shrugged and pushed past Eben, who was forced to step aside. Gia followed him around the corner. Eben had almost decided to go with them when he heard many footsteps coming down the hall from the opposite direction. In a moment, Lilith appeared. Behind her were the students she had gathered in the library. Lilith! Theron's voice rose to a furious shout. What have you done? The students stopped and Lilith glared back. What are you talking about, Theron? We heard a tumult and came to see what, what it was. You lie, Theron snarled, stepping, stepping forwards. Eben gripped her arm and Caleb took the other. We know what you did, Lilith. And what exactly is that? Zane's voice rolled through the hallway, freezing them like mind magic. The dean swept forwards, Gia at his side, and both came to a stop between the two groups. Gia spoke first. Lilith, can you account for your whereabouts this evening? 
<clears throat> Lilith blinked, brow furrowing with doubt. I, I was in the library with my friends. We saw you, cried Theron. We saw you in the garden, Lilith. And then you came back into the citadel just before Creedel was killed. Beneath her dark skin, Lilith went gray as ash. Killed? I. She swallowed, looking at the others beside her. I only stepped out to get some air, and then I went straight back to the others. They were there. No, I am telling the truth. She is, said Orin immediately. But on Lilith's other side, Nella hesitated. It was only a moment before she nodded in assent, but Eben noted it. Very well, said Gia. Then we are done here. All of you, return to your rooms. Eben, if you would, look in upon Estrella in her dormitory. I will be there as soon as I can, but I want to ensure she has friends about her. She is far too young to have witnessed something so wretched. I will, instruct her. Eben noted that Zane fixed him with a dark look and did not seem pleased to see them go, but again he turned without speaking, and Eben hastened away before they could be recalled. The students with Lilith were silent. Theron gave them all dirty looks as they went, and once the hallway branched off, she dragged Eben and Caleb in another direction. Out of earshot, she pressed them both into an alcove. Lilith must have had something to do with this. I know it. Caleb frowned and looked down at his feet. I am not so certain. Theron opened her mouth, but Eben jumped in before she could speak. He is right, Theron. We cannot know anything for certain. We only lost sight of her for a moment. How could she have killed him and then returned to the library so quickly? It was not such a long distance, said Theron. I think that after she lost us, she made for the vaults, but she came upon Creedel, quilt, killed him, and then ran for the library as quickly as she could before anyone could see what she had done. But why, said Caleb, for what purpose? For no purpose, said Theron. He must have surprised her. Do you remember this morning when he asked for my key to the vaults? Creedel never enters the vaults, but some business must have called him there. Lilith did not expect that, and so when, she saw, when he saw her, she panicked. Eben looked down the hall towards where Lilith and the others had vanished. He gritted his teeth and shook his head. I do not know, Theron. Lilith has, Lilith has been cruel to me since the day I arrived, but a murderer? Theron scowled. I do not think she is some vile killer who sits about plotting the slow, torturous deaths of others, but I know she is ruthless and ambitious and tied closely to the dark dealings of her family. The Aarons may hold no candle to, fa to the family Drayden, yet it is known that they too will kill any who stand in their way. But Lilith is scarcely more than a girl, said Caelan. We all are. You mean you are, said Theron. She is on the cusp of her eighteenth year, more than old enough to act as an agent of her house, and indeed I believe she may be. She may not have wished for Creedel's death, but she had a hand in it nonetheless, for Yaren desires the treasures within the vaults. <coughs> if what you say is true, I am more fearful than before, said Caleb. I want to prove the guilt of those who had a hand in the attack. But if Yaren will kill to protect the secret, might we not die ourselves? And our new dean is out for Eben's blood. If we try to investigate, we may land ourselves in even greater danger or be expelled. And from outside the academy, we can do nothing. If we remain but do nothing, then what does it matter if we expelled or not, said Theron. Underrealm itself is in danger. Do you think we can attend our studies for the next few years and hope the war will pass us by? Caleb fixed her with a hard look. I think it is easier for you to say that than for us. You have completed your studies and everyone knows it. If you left now, you would be a full-fledged wizard, whether or not you had the Academy's blessings to practice. Blessing to practice. Eben and I have not, have not that luxury. You ask us to risk all our learning, many years more of education, trying to prove guilt that may or may not exist. Theron had no answer for that and looked uneasily away from them both. Do you feel the same, Eben? But Eben scarcely heard her. His thoughts were far away upon the southern cliffs of the seat where Cyrus's flesh had turned to stone under his hand. He felt as though he stood upon those cliffs again. He could step forwards, plunging himself into the abyss with no hope of return. If he joined Theron in a hunt for Lilith, he could be expelled or die or be forced to kill again. But if he stayed his hand, if he shut his eyes and feigned ignorance of the dark clouds swirling about the academy, then others might perish, and if Eben did not kill them, still he would bear the guilt of it. Eben, said Theron, I do not know. I do not know. I have no wish to be killed or expelled in a hunt for the truth, but neither do I wish to sit and do nothing when it may lead to the deaths of others like Creedel. I know not what to do. That is hardly helpful, said Theron, snorting. Choosing to do nothing is still a choice. I do not wish to do nothing, said Eben, yet I fear to do anything. I, how can I explain it when I do not understand it myself? Eben, stop being a coward and leave off, Theron. He pushed her away and strode off down the hallway without... Pushed her away and strode down the hallway without looking back, for he knew he would find her glaring at him in anger. Cyrus's face flashed before his eyes again and then again, and the former dean's dry, crusted lisp, lips whispered the word murderer. He shivered, hating himself for his indecision, yet how could he ease his mind? To whom could he speak? The answer came in a flash. Only one person would understand. Only one soul could hear him freely. Adara. Chapter 7. It was far too late to consider leaving the academy to see her, and the instructors were all on high alert after Creedel's murder, so Evan did as he had promised and went to Estrella's dormitory to visit her, but he found Ezra sitting in the common room instead. She looked up as he entered. Her eyes were vacant. Is Estrella here? Evan said, keeping his voice hushed. The common room was empty, save for the two of them. She has gone to bed, said Ezra. Evan nodded. I should do the same then, as should you, I suppose. Do you, do you wish me to walk you back to the dormitories? Ezra scowled. He raised his hand at once. Hands at once. I only mean it must have been terrible to find, to find him. 
She seemed to consider that for a moment. I suppose it was terrible, she murmured. Lifting a hand, she showed Eben her fingers. He could see them twitching. See? My hands are shaking. Who could blame you? I can only imagine what it has done to Estrella. Ezra lowered her hand and looked at the dormitory door mournfully. I wish she had not seen him, she said, voice scarcely above a whisper. She has always been so fragile. You have known her long, then? said Eben. Her eyes flashed. I am not here to swap tales with you, gold bag. Eben ducked his head. I am sorry, he muttered. Good eve. He returned to the dormitory and went to bed at once, hoping his thoughts would be clearer in the morning. Instead, he lay awake for hours, wrestling with thoughts of Cyrus and Crudel. Both had made his first few months at the Academy terrible, though for very different reasons, and now both were dead. He fell asleep, seeing their faces, their lifeless eyes staring into his own. A dark mood had settled over the Academy the next morning, like a funeral pall thrown over all who dwelt within. The dining hall was somber, and no one dared speak above a whisper. Eben found Caleb and sat with him, neither saying a word. Theron arrived soon after, and though she sat with them both, she did not meet Eben's eyes. I did some asking last night, last night after, well, after, she muttered. Nothing was taken from the vaults. Creedel must have happened upon Lilith as she was trying to get in, not out. If she did not wish to discuss their argument from last night, Eben was too hap was happy enough to oblige. That is good, I suppose. Not good for Creedel, said Caleb. Eben looked away. Then his eyes caught on something strange. A white tabard amid the sea of black robes. He looked around about the room to find more of them. Soldiers in white and gold and all bearing swords and shields. Who are they? He said, pointing. Theron and Calum raised their eyes and Calum's mouth fell open. The High King's guards. What are they doing here? No doubt they were sent to aid the Academy's defenses after the murder, said Theron. Despite himself, Eben laughed. What do they hope to do? Have they forgotten this is a school of wizards? Their blades and armor will help them little against all but the youngest of students. Mayhap they think the murderer was no wizard, said Calum. After all, Creedel was not killed with magic but by a dagger to the throat. They fell silent at that. Creedel's sightless eyes danced in Eben's vision again, and then his face turned into Cyrus's. Eben's breath came harsh and shallow, and lights danced at the edge of his eyes. Eben, what is wrong? said Theron. Your face is pale. I need, I need to walk. I need air. He stood, and they made to follow, but he waved them back down. No, thank you. I would rather be alone. I will find you later, in the library, mayhap. <clears throat> His friends settled back into their seats, though Calum clearly wanted to come. Eben left the dining hall, nearly stumbling against the door on his way. The hall was cold, colder than he remembered, or may have it was just that the dining hall had grown too warm. He pressed his hand against the frigid stone to steady himself. He must see Adara. Now, he thought? Yes, he could not attend his studies like this. Half of him wanted to vomit, and the other wanted to return to bed, to curl in a ball and never rise again. If he could not unburden himself, he feared his height might, heart might fail him. His mind made up, he went quickly to the Academy's wide front hall. His heart crashed in vicious thunder at his temples as he entered the open space with its vaulted ceiling, but then he sighed in relief. The sharp old caretaker, Melly, was not standing guard at the front door she, as he had feared she might be. It was a bald man instead, with a crooked back and roomy eyes, who Eben had heard was, called Crat, was named Cratchit. Cratchit! I forgot about Cratchit. Poor Cratchit. Some old wizard called back to duty long after his prime to fill one of the many sudden vacancies in the academy's staff. He wandered about his post, eyes seeming to catch nothing at all. Eben waited until he had rounded the corner and then ran for the front door and out into the street. He gave silent thanks for the well-oiled hinges as he swung the door shut behind him. Sticking his hands into either sleeve against Autumn's chill, he set off into the streets. The air bit briskly into his skin, even, though his, even through his thick robe, and he hurried his pace to get the blood moving. He thanked the sky that it had not yet snowed, though clouds crowned the sky, making him anxious. Quickly, he turned his steps west and north, winding his way through the city to where he knew a blue door was waiting. All about him, the seat was bustling. Soldiers patrolled the streets wearing different colors, the white and gold of the High King, the green and white of Selvin. Oh, gotta check these.
The white and gold of the High King, the green and white of Selvin. Is that right? I don't think that's right. Blue and white. And the mystics red and silver but two there were masons and carpenters aplenty for buildings across the island were in need of repair del moon had wreaked terrible havoc across the island as had their allies the shades houses and shops and taverns alike had been torn asunder and now if the owners were still alive those structures were being rebuilt the air rang with hammer beats and the songs of saws and choirs of shouting builders after the tragedy the new activity joined into a chorus that lifted the heart and yet it held also an undertone of urgency war was upon underrealm now and if it had not yet blossomed to its full fury not a soul upon the seat doubted that it would given time when at last he reached his destination, Evan ducked into an alley and looked furtively about. Most upon the seat knew that academy students were not allowed out until evening, and he had no wish for word to be sent back about where he had gone. But no one seemed to pay him any mind, so he slipped from the alley and across to the blue door, entering as quickly as he could. There were not so many people lounging about the front room as when Eben had first come. No doubt some had fallen in the fighting while others had left the seat. But Eben guessed that the blue door saw its fair share of customers these days. Not only would many seek comfort after the attack, but the seat now housed soldiers from across the Nine Kingdoms. His stomach twisted at the thought that Adara might be occupied already, but then he saw her in the corner playing her harp. She flashed him a wide smile and he returned it. Then the matron swept forwards to greet him. Good day, sir. Do you wish to visit Adara? If she will see me. Eben reached for his coin purse, but the matron waved it off. I do not doubt that she will, but you have not yet used up all of your all your last payment. Her gaze slid past him. Adara stood at once and approached, leading Eben to her room by the hand. In, inside, she gripped his robes and pulled him close for a deep kiss. I have sorely missed you, he said, holding her out by the shoulders to look at her. And I you. But what are you doing here now? It is the middle of the day. I had to come. My heart is in turmoil and my mind will offer no rest. Her hand slid down his chest, her smile coquettish. Then it will be my pleasure to soothe you. I, that is not what I came for. She cocked her head, though her smile did not wilt. I never thought to have you refuse me. That made him chuckle. Nor did I ever expect to hear myself do so, but I came because there are things I must speak of, and they are, they are things I can say to no one else. The smile faded, and her eyes grew solemn. I think I see your mind. Come then, sit and speak. Will you take wine? Please. She fetched him a cup and poured one for herself as well. He took a deep drink and then stared at his hands in silence. Adara said nothing, only waited patiently, soft eyes never leaving his face. He wanted badly to tell her of the thoughts that plagued him, but now that he was here, his tongue felt thick and limp in his mouth. My family is coming to the seat, he said, because that, at least, was easy to say. And are you pleased, she said, her tone very careful. Eben shrugged. Mayhap. I shall see my sister again, and that is a joy, but my reunion with my father shall be not quite so happy, I fear. She placed a hand on his knee. If he should trouble you, I will always be here to help you forget. That would be most unwise, Eben said quickly. I would be foolish to visit you while my father resides upon the seat. No doubt he will have me watched. He might scorn me if he learns I am visiting a house of lovers, and that I could bear, but then he might go further, seeking to visit some sort of harm upon you. Adara's eyes hardened and her lips drew tight. He would not dare raise a hand against a lover. The king's law protects us. Nothing so brazen. Eben shook his head. He is a snake and could devise any manner of trouble for you. Some of the fire left her. I will take you at your word. Worry not. If you cannot see me while your family is upon the seat, I will still be here when they leave. And yet, forgive me for saying so, Eben, but this is not why you have come to see me today, and you are only wasting time by not speaking of it. He dropped his gaze, staring at his hands where they fidgeted in his lap. When he spoke, his voice was far smaller than he had meant it to be. No, it is not. I, I cannot st stop seeing that is remembering what happened. I understand, she murmured. It was no happy memory. That was the first day I saw someone killed, and then in the same day, I, too, struck a death blow. <clears throat> you were blameless. Had you not done what you did, he would have murdered you instead. He winced. And yet. She nodded slowly. And yet. It may be the truth, but I know that makes it no easier to bear. His throat grew dry, and so he drained the cup. She went for the pitcher, but he shook his head. No more, at least not yet. There is something else, something I have thought of often since the attack. Had I not seen the two of you slipping away through the city, you would have gone with him. Adar's eyes grew sharper. Eben, I have told you. No, forgive me, he said hastily. I did not mean that as it sounded. I understand that you are a lover, and you have had no... And you had no knowledge of Cyrus other than his custom, I imagine. What I mean is, had I not come after you, he would have taken you from the seat in safety. He only hurt you after I attacked him. Without me, you would not have been harmed. Oh, Eben, she said, softening, does that truly worry you? I am glad you came when you did. I knew Cyrus for a snake, but not the extent of his treachery. I thought he could remove me from the seat in safety, and so I went with him, planning to leave his company in the first town we reached. But if I had known he ever laid a hand upon you, I would not have taken a single step by his side. 
She cupped his cheek with her hand and brushed her fingers to push a lock of hair behind his ear. Lover's, lover's words, he thought. And yet when she had learned the truth, she had rejected Cyrus. It, set his mind re it sent his mind reeling, but he could not waste thought on this now. He had come here to speak, not to wrestle with his feelings with for Adara, though already he suspected that they were stronger than might be wise. I think of him often, said Evan. I see his face frozen in that death scream, and I hear him as he plunges into the great bay. In my dreams he visits me, and in my waking hours his wail is like a far-off thing, drifting to my ears through the windows, and I cannot escape it nor speak of my troubles. I can neither. And I can neither escape it nor speak of my troubles. How could I look Caleb and Theron in the eye if they knew what I had done? Yet sometimes I wish to tell them, if only so I need to bear the burden alone. Need not bear the burden alone. You cannot tell them. You must not. Evan raised an eyebrow. Why so adamant? They are my friends. They would not betray me to the constables. Adara pursed her lips and took another sip of her wine. The king's law would justify what we did, were the constables or the mystics to know. It is not the king's law we must fear. It is your family. No matter the justification, how do you think your father would react if it were known that you killed a scion of the family Drayden? Evan's hand trembled at the thought. My family would, my friends would never tell my family. Her eyes grew mournful and she put a hand on him. Her eyes grow mournful? Hmm. Her eyes grew mournful and she put a hand on his. I know Theron well enough. <clears throat> she would understand. I know she had no love for Cyrus. But Caleb, understand that I have not met him. Yet he is a royal and thus holds a greater regard for the king's law. He would not tell your kin, but he might tell the constables, and then word of it would reach your family regardless. I cannot believe a royal would be satisfied until the matter was brought before the law. Eben's brow furrowed. He wished to deny Adara's words, and yet it did sound like something Caelan would do. The boy would wish the matter resolved to the satisfaction of himself, the king's law, and likely some within the academy. Then word would sur surely reach his father. The thought made him cringe. Eben could only imagine what might happen to him then. Some of his worry must have shown in his eyes, for Adara gripped his hands tighter. I see your fear. Do not let your heart be troubled. We, near fe we need fear nothing, for your family will never learn the truth. But then what am I to do? I may keep the secret from my family and the king's law, and even my friends, but I cannot keep it from myself, and it is my own mind that plagues me. Then take comfort in me. Adar gently pulled him close, planting a kiss on one cheek and then the other. Tell me of your worries and your fears, and let me dispel them. Her kisses fell to his neck as her hand slid across his chest. Evan gulped. That is an attractive prospect, to be certain. He drew back and met her eyes. It will be as you say, at least for now. But you might not feel the same if you could only meet them. Theron and Caleb, I mean. What if we spent time together, all of us, beyond the blue door? Adara frowned, and in her eyes there was a worry Eben could not place. Are you certain that is wise? If your father is having you watched. He would not do so yet, not until he reaches the seat, and it would gladden my heart to have you all together, you three who I love most in this world. He blushed and looked away, for that seemed a foolish thing to say. She is a lover, he reminded himself. He had known that when first he came to see her and every time since. Why, then, was it so hard not to think of Adara as something more? He did not see her as his, certainly, and yet, whenever he thought of her, it seemed to him that each belonged to the other. Then, to his surprise, Adara's hand was on his cheek, and she turned him to face her. Softly, she said, If it would ease your mind, then gladly will I meet them. Her hand fell to push him onto the bed, and then she was atop him. After all, it is my duty to ease your burden burdens. His only reply was to kiss her. Brown chicken, brown cow! Oh, Lord. Chapter 8. Oh, oh so tired. We're in hungry now as well. Yay for combinations. Chapter 8. Some hours later, Evan sat drinking in a tavern a few streets over from the, aca over from the academy. Soon the bells would ring for the midday... Midday meal? Yeah, okay. And he might slip in through the front door and notice it was not uncommon for students to take their meals in the city and he could merge with the crowd without drawing much attention. Some gave him odd looks as he waited. His academy student robes were out of place in the tavern before midday. But after the, his visit to Adara, he was able, unable to summon much concern. You must learn to wash the smell off, little gold bag. Mako's growling voice nearly made Eben choke on his wine. The bodyguard had appeared at his elbow without warning. Now he pushed Eben aside and slid onto the bench beside him. Eben was glad to see the man, but he could not stop a nagging thought, warning him that Ma Mako had blocked his exit. Mayhap I shall bathe instead of eating. You had better. You smell more like your lover than yourself. At Mako's teeth appeared in a cruel smile, though Eben did not find it quite so frightening as he once had. How did you know to find me here? I did not. I had planned on, on visiting you in the library this afternoon and was waiting for my chance to slip inside the citadel, only by chance that I entered this place to find you waiting for me instead. 
Waiting for you, said Evan, chuckling. I knew not that you sought me. Mako's smirk widened and he motioned to a barman for ale, but then his face grew solemn. You should have guessed it after what, ha what happened in the academy last night. I had come to see that you are all that you are all right. Creedel's corpse flashed in his mind and Evan shook the, shook the thought away. I am whole. It is kind of you to worry, but I was nowhere near the murder. That is not what I have heard. It seems you were one of the first to arrive after the body was discovered. One of the first, but not the first. Creedel was already cooling beyond any help when I got there. Do you know out of what happened? Have you learned anything since? Said Mako. Evan looked around with discomfort, but the bodyguard set a steady hand on his shoulder and grinned. No one gets close enough to listen in on me, boy, not without my knowing it. Speak. Still, Evan hesitated a moment before answering. We were following Lilith just before it happened. She was sharing wine with friends, and then she went out into the gardens. We thought she was alone, but then we heard her speaking to someone. Who? We know not. We tried to find out, but Lilith left, and her friend disappeared. That is when the screaming started, and Creedel's body was found. Mako drummed his fingers on the table, but never took his gaze from Evan. His ale arrived, and he took a deep gulp. It seems there's a strong case to be made for Lilith's guilt. Mayhap, said Evan, nodding slowly, yet we lost sight of her for only a moment. Much can be done in a moment. A moment is longer than I need to cut a man's throat, I promise you. <clears throat> Evan shuddered and looked into his wine cup. You think she did it then? I think more and more signs point that way. If Lilith had a hand in the theft of, from the vaults or in Creedel's death, it seems the family Yaren stands much to gain. The artifacts, you mean? That was Theron's guess. The family Yaren thwarts us in many things and seeks ever to expand their influence. If they had even a handful of the more powerful artifacts in the Academy's bowels, Drayden's star might wane. Do not shrug. You might not care for your father's ill fortune, but I would wager you care for Halab's. Eben flushed. Of course I wish no harm upon her, and yet what is more and what is more, if it is true that Yaren played a role in the attack upon the seat, then I have no wish for their future success. They must be brought to justice. Mako smirked. How very noble of you. I think you will have ample opportunity to catch her and expose the truth. Why? She has stolen from the vaults already, but now she has killed Creedel before their doors. Why? Why would she have been there if not to steal again? She was thwarted this time by Creedel, but that does not mean she will give up. Keep following her, Evan. Catch her in the act, and you shall have your justice. Mayhap, you shall even have it before another corpse is on her hands. Evan frowned into his cup. I hope so. We will speak more of this later. I have not only come to ask you about Creedel's murder. I bring word from the family. Evan sighed. What is it this time? They will arrive to the seat upon the morrow, and hope you will join them in the manor. A shiver rippled through him, sliding down his back from the base of his skull. He tried to hide it, though Mako's glinting eyes said he had failed. I will, of course, you may tell them. I shall, and that brings this conversation to an end, and just in time. Before Evan could ask what the bodyguard meant, the academy's bells began to toll, signaling the end of, the, of morning classes and the serving of the midday meal. Evan gaped. How did you... Mako pointed to the rear of the tavern. On a shelf behind the bar sat a large hourglass. The tavern's owner turned it over even as Evan watched. I am no wizard, little Eben, though the look on your face was a delight. Often simple observation serves better than magic. I wish you well in your quest for the truth. Only take care and do not place yourself in danger you cannot get back out of. It would have been a tremendous waste of my of my effort to save you from the attack on the seat, only for you to die now. I will keep that in mind, said Eben, giving him a wry smile. I would hate to see your effort wasted. Mako laughed, tossed a gold weight on the table for the drinks, and slipped out the door. <clears throat> Chapter 8 done.
Chapter 9. By the time Eben reached the academy's wide front door, students were already pouring out into the streets. He waited until a sizable crowd was pressing through and then slipped inside between them. Melly was back on watch and she fixed him with a suspicious glare as he passed by, but he escaped without incident she did not call after him. He rounded the corner of the first hallway and pressed himself against a stone, letting out a long sigh of relief. Eben. He very nearly jumped out of his skin at the shout. There was Perrin, her massive frame trundling down the hallway towards him, brow almost joined, brows almost joined as she frowned. Instructor Perrin, stammered Eben. I, that is, I... Stow it. She folded her arms and peered down at him through narrowed eyes. Did you think I would no not note your absence? <clears throat> Did you not think I would notice your absence? An empty seat is a tad conspicuous, especially so near the front. Evan bowed his head. In truth, he had not thought over much about it. Creedell had been so terrified of Evan that the instructor... Creedell had been so terrified of Evan that he said nothing when... Creedell had been so terrified that he that he said nothing of the many occasions. Creedell had been too terrified to say anything of the many of the many times. Evan. Creedell had been too terrified to say anything of the many times Evan had vanished from the classroom. I am sorry, Instructor. I was only... A massive hand clap, clapped down on his shoulder, squeezing tight, but not painfully. When he raised his eyes again, Evan found Perrin looking back at him with soft concern. You do not need to tell me where you have been. Last night was a terrible tragedy, and none could fault you for needing to clear your mind after what you saw. Only next time, tell me. He ducked his head again, but this time in shame. She thought he was upset over Creedell's death, and Evan supposed he was, but that was far overshadowed by his worries about Cyrus and Lilith and now his family's arrival upon the seat. <clears throat> what did it say about him that he had so little concern for the death of his first instructor at the academy? But he could say none of this, of course, so he only mumbled. I will remember, instructor. Thank you. And again, I am sorry. Perrin clapped his shoulder again. Evan thought the spot, spot might bruise and left him. Evan shuffled towards the dining hall, trying not to feel so wretched. The moment he stepped inside, Caleb and Theron leapt up from their seats and came to him. "'Where were you this morning?' hissed Caleb. "'I made a wager with him that you went to see your lover,' said Theron with a grin. "'Tell me I am a gold weight richer.' "'You are.' Evan could not help matching her smile, but Caleb drew back, his eyes filled with reproach. "'Evan, what possesses you? No one minds you having a lover, but leaving your classes to visit her?' "'My thoughts would give me no peace,' said Evan, frowning at him. "'You cannot tell me your mind is inured to the sight of corpses, even after the attack on the seat.' Caleb had no answer for that, and he lowered his eyes, but Theron took her arms and pulled them took their arms and pulled them both towards the door. Enough of that. Come to the library, Eben, for we have something to show you. What is it? said Eben. I have not even eaten. I took a roll for you. Theron produced the mangled, squished thing from her pocket and shoved it into his hand. Eben grimaced. Soon they whisked him into the library and up the stairs. Where they huddled in the third floor corner, Caleb went to a, went to the wall and put forth his power, and the stone shifted to reveal his secret cubbyhole. He drew an old tome of plain brown leather, unadorned, with no title on the cover. I found this book, said Caleb. In the library, said Eben, raising his eyebrows. Wonders may never cease. It was hidden, Caleb said, scowling. It was covered in dark and dust behind a bookshelf. Most likely it fell, said Eben. What of it? Uh, Caleb looked at him, almost haughty. Eben, I know nearly every inch of this library. The shelf was flushed to the wall until at most a week ago. Someone wanted to hide this book. Theron took the book to show Eben. They wanted to hide it because it is from the vaults. Eben recoiled. Do, do you mean it is enchanted? He swallowed hard, wondering if he should run. 
She rolled her eyes. It is not from within the vaults, you craven. It is a logbook, a very old logbook. Eben relaxed and, after a moment, leaned forwards to look at the book with fresh interest. But why would it be here? Why indeed, especially one so ancient? It is centuries old, and I doubt... It is centuries old, and at first I doubted it could have any unchanged entries. What do you mean, said Eben? When an item comes to the vaults, we enter it in a new page on a logbook with the room's number noted here. Theron pointed to the top right corner of a page where a number had been scrawled and then crossed through with the red X. Once all the entries have been crossed out, the logbook is retired to the archives. This book is from hundreds of years ago. The entries should have been replaced with other artifacts, but one... Evan pointed to the entry on the open page. It described a cloak of green cloth and the, enchantments pla and the enchantment placed upon it. A spell of warding? What is that? Theron glanced at it. Look here, runes of silver sewn into the collar and imbued with mentalist spells. They infuse the cloth with power so that it protects the wearer with magic. So, though the cloak would still be cloth and therefore light, it would protect you like a shirt of chain. Shirt of mail. Although, see here, she pointed to the bottom of the page where a note had been added. Verified to be drained upon the 12th of Eunice, year of Underrealm 823. Drained, said Evan. What does that mean? Any wizard can put some of their magic into an object, Theron explained. A sword imbued with elementalism may burn with fire at a word, or, as with this cloak, mentalism may make objects much stronger than normal. The magic will leach out with time, often in the course of a day or so, but if runes are carved or woven into the object, they can be made to hold the magic for longer, or, in the case of some mighty wizard kings, forever. That is why these artifacts are kept within the vaults and out of reach until their power fades. It was a command of the fearless decree. The king's law says no wizard may sit up a throne, and a king with enough enchanted objects is as good as a wizard king. Okay, I meant to check something, almost forgot about it. 
Interesting. Okay. Do 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 do. So we have an inaccuracy we ha here we have to correct. King's Law, do 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 do. Says no wizard may sit a throne, and a king with enough enchanted objects is as good as a wizard king. Enchanted objects are outlawed then? Yes and no, said Caleb. Many can be th found throughout Underrealm, and some wizards will make small enchantments for everyday use. The mystics care not. Only objects of great power are controlled. The Lord Chancellor of the Mystics is the final authority on which artifacts must be kept within the vaults and which are not worth the trouble. One entry in that logbook remains, says, said Theron. One artifact that is still within the vaults, or was until it was stolen. Edmund flipped through the pages to find the entry, glancing at the other listings as he did. There was a sphere of gold bearing runes like those on the Academy's front door. The text said that with the right words it could erupt into a giant ball of flame and consume everything nearby and then return to its original shape, unharmed. The next page described a circlet that let the wearer vanish from sight. He turned page after page, reading about each artifact in turn. Some held powers he could, power he could scarcely imagine, while others seemed only to have a practical, everyday sort of use. It seemed different Lord Chancellors of years past had had very different ideas of what sort of enchantment should be protected within the vaults. Ah. But all the entries were crossed out with the red X until at last he found the one that was not. The amulet of Kakit. This amulet was of crystal. Is bound in gold and, depend and depends from a chain of silver. Its dark powers were hers and shows no sign. Its dark powers were hers and show no signs of decay despite the many centuries since she was pried from her long rotting bones in the southern reaches of Idris. Added to the vaults upon the 10th of Aralus, the year of Underrealm 194. The artifact's names had two lines drawn in red ink beneath it, but nothing more was said of its properties. There was a crude sketch of the amulet. The crystal was shaped like an arrowhead pointing down and away from the wearer's throat. Evan flipped to the next page, but it was the... But it was only the logbook's next entry. This amulet, this is that is what was taken, said Eben. I am sure, said Theron. See where they have drawn a line beneath it? There must have they must have planned this for some time. I fear to do not understand what it does, said Eben. Nor I, said Theron, but it is crystal, and therefore it must be powerful. Nothing holds magic so well as crystal. This is the missing logbook. When I could not find the entry of what had been stolen, I thought it was a clerical error, but it was here in this book which someone stole. And there is something else. Keep turning the pages. <clears throat> Evan did and Sood came upon where some leaves had been torn from the book. One remnant had some smudge writing near its spine, but he could not make out what it said. Why are these pages torn, said Evan? More artifacts, likely more they planned to steal. Mayhap they torn the pages out to better keep the secret and then tried to hide the tome. Why not destroy the book rather than hide it, said Evan? It seems it would hardly have been missed if you did not know where it had gone. Theron shrugged. Mayhap the thief meant to take the amulet and then chose other and then choose other artifacts to steal later. Or mayhap they meant to destroy it, but they were nearly discovered holding it and concealed it in haste. Who is to say? Should we tell Gia or the Dean? said Caleb. No, I will arrange for it to be found in a way that leaves us all blameless. Hopefully they will read through the pages and realize what has been taken. But still we know nothing of the amulet's power, said Evan. We have a name, said Caleb. Kakit. We must discover who she was. She sounds familiar, but I cannot place her. Doubtless we will find something in an account of the Dark War and the Fearless Decree. I will start searching at once. If only there were more than one copy, Evan said, shaking his head. Said Evan, shaking his head. I would like to help in the search. We know she lived in Idris and, lo and was long dead by the year 194, said Caleb. The two of you should search for more books from that time. Who knows but that you may find the truth before I do. Theron gave a long-suffering sigh. Does it matter if we know what Kikit's amulet does? We know Lilith has stolen it and that we must reclaim it from her. The amulet's enchantments do not seem important. Caleb frowned. We still do not know for certain that Lilith stole the amulet. Theron's eyes slid over his shoulder, 
hardening as he spoke. We could always ask her ourselves. They followed her gaze. There was Lilith, a few dozen paces away and heading straight for them. Eben tried to speak a word of restraint, but Theron left from her chair and strode forwards to meet her. Caleb and Eben scrambled to follow, flanking her on either side as she and Lilith faced off. Uncomfortably, Eben realized that he and Caleb probably looked a great deal like Orin and Nella when they stood like bodyguards by Lilith's side. "'Good day, Lilith,' said Theron evenly. "'How odd that you should seek us out, for I have had a mind to speak to you as well.' Lilith stared, blinked, and then turned her gaze to Eben. "'Good day, Eben. I hope you have been well. Some friends and I have been con congregating here in the library after the Academy's hours, and I was wondering if you might like to join us.' Slowly she turned to Caleb. "'You too would be most welcome, Caleb of the family, Connell.' Eben blinked. He gave his friends a sharp look, but they both seem seemed equal equally mystified. He cleared his throat, drawing Lilith's attention back to him. "'We have questions for you, Lilith,' as Theron said. Theron's eyes had grown dangerously narrow. "'Where were you when the seat was attacked?' For a moment, Lilith said nothing. Then she shook her head as though the thought were distressing before finally turning to Theron. What do you mean? I was home in Feldemar. You already knew that. All of you did. She gave three sharp blinks and then returned her attention to Eben. What say you, son of Drayden? We would be most privileged by your presence, by both of you. We call ourselves the Goldbag Society, after all. Her lips twisted in a small, self-deprecating smile. Theron's breath came quicker and she took a half step forwards. Eben wanted to place a hand on her elbow, but he was suddenly afraid she might strike him. Your petty arrogance does you no favors, Lilith. Why did your family draw you home to Feldemar just as the seat was attacked? Lilith focused on her again, brow furrowing as though it were a great inconvenience. I... She shook her head. What are you saying? Do you mean to say I had something to do with the attack? I said nothing of the sort. Theron's smile grew cruel. But now that you mention it, is there any truth to such a thought? Again, Lilith shook her head, her eyes growing sharp and focused. She took a step back, staring at Evan and Caelan as though seeing them for the first time. I cannot believe this. I do not know what foolishness made me invite you to our gatherings. Theron stepped forwards as though she would catch Lilith by the hand and prevent her escape. You did not answer me. Why did you mention yourself in connection to the attacks, Lilith? What are you hiding? Lilith was shaking with rage, but, too, her eyes were hurt as they stared into Theron's. That you would think such a thing of me shows your ignorance. I was devastated when I learned of Dulmoon's treachery. Until we learned what had happened, I wept every day for fear that my friends and classmates, and yes, even you, might have perished in the fighting. Sentiment is an ill look for you, spat Theron, like an adder wrapping itself in feathers and calling itself a songbird. Again Lilith retreated, this time in earnest, turning away, but she stopped after a few steps and gave them a withering look over her shoulder. Call me an adder then, but call me also a fool for thinking your death a tragedy. She swept off, and for a moment Eben thought Theron would pursue her. He seized one elbow and Caleb the other, and they half dragged her to their chairs in the corner. But when he turned back, but when he looked back over his shoulder, he saw Lilith was looking at them again. Fury twisted her face, and angry tears wet her cheeks. At last, she turned and ran away, vanishing among the bookshelves. By the time they returned to their chairs, Theron was shaking. She rounded on Evan and Caleb, that manipulative little sow. I know she had something to do with the theft, and there is a fast way to prove it. We must get into the vaults. Get into the vaults, said Caleb, his eyes wide. You are mad. We could be expelled. Not if they do not catch us. And if we visit the room where the amulet was stolen, I will know for certain whether it was Lilith who did the deed. How, said Eben, shrugging. What do you hope to find? Every wizard has a, a sort of signature, said Theron. Think of it like handwriting, an imprint upon the spells they cast. One wizard who knows another well can read the signature. If I can investigate the vault where the artifact was taken, I can tell if it was Lilith who stole it. Spell sight? No, I'm not. What are you talking about, babe? I'm like a quarter of the way through the book. Good to see you, though. <clears throat> do 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 do. That is wildly inaccurate practice and prone to errors, said Caleb. <laughs> it's quiet today. That's probably the most chat we've seen from anybody so far. Uh, da, 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 da. Every instructor speaks of its unreliability. No king's court will accept such as testimony, except in some of the outland kingdoms. Theron slapped her hand. Uh, 
on the back of a chair. I know Lilith's mark. I will know if it was her. A moment passed. Evan cleared his throat and then quietly said, What do you propose to do? She gave a thin-lipped smile. I can sneak into the vaults with Calum. After I conduct my search, Calum can shift stone and tunnel our way out. Only Calum, said Evan? What of me? Theron shook her head. Forgive me for saying so, Evan, but you could do nothing to help. You do not yet command the magic required to aid our escape. <clears throat> Ha! Forgive me for saying so, but you could do nothing to help. You do not yet command the magic required to aid our escape. Eben gave them both an uneasy look. Then he stepped away from the... Did she say how they were going to escape? Eben gave them both an uneasy look. Then he stepped away from the chairs to the corner where the wall sat exposed between two shelves. He reached out and set his hand on the stone. Magic coursed through him. The stone melted and warped beneath his hand, folding away to reveal the hidden shelf where Caleb stowed books he wished to keep secret. Theron's brows arched. You've learned to shift stone? Ever since the attack on the seat, Eben said, forcing his thoughts away from the sound of Cyrus's scream. That is often the way of it. Once the first step is taken, the rest come easier, said Caelan brightly. I knew nothing of this, Eben. Congratulations. You are learning far more quickly than I did. Only because I am six years older, said Eben, and I cannot put the stone back, only push it away. I can replace it, said Caelan, and then and this will make the tunneling faster. You are interested in the plan, then? Theron grinned. This may work, after all. Two alchemists to aid our escape instead of only one. You mean transmuters. I mean be silent, Caelan. When do you propose we act, said Evan. Theron pursed her lips. We can do nothing tonight. It would be best to avoid the vaults until Sunday. The Academy will be on holiday, and I will be performing my services. Lilith will not. The days between now and then will give me time to prepare. Evan sagged, for a thought had struck him. Very well, he sighed, if we must. What troubles you, said Caelan. It is my family, said Evan, lowering his gaze. They arrive upon the seat on the morrow. They could trouble our they could trouble our plan, said Caelan. There's no way that How could they interfere, said Caleb. There's no way they could know what we mean to do. Of course not, said Evan. Not directly, said Evan. Of course not, said Evan, but my father will no doubt have some torment for me in one form or another. With an encouraging smile, Theron clapped his shoulder. Try not to worry over much. If you should be drawn away Sunday night, I believe Caleb and I can manage without you. Caleb straightened and reached for his book. And in the meantime, we still have work to do. Who knows what we might learn before then if we find out about this keki. Theron sighed and stood. Very well, we are bound for the bookshelves after all, Eben, though it pains me as a woman of action. Eben joined her, and together they returned to the shelves, searching through spines in the library's quiet. Chapter 9, done! Thanks for the host, Chayton. Mucho appreciado. Hey, Wordwin, you're still here. I thought maybe you had abandoned me. Leaving me alone to die. You know, I've been meaning to do something for a long time, and I'm going to do it now.
All right. Chapter 10. The next morning, Eben sat in class with Perrin beside him. The poor bench groaned and creaked under the woman's mammoth weight, and Eben held himself ready to leap out of the way should it snap to kindling beneath them. Perrin had already gone about the class and set the other students to their task before coming to him. We did not have time yesterday, but now you will learn your aim while under my tutelage, Perrin began. You had one spell to master before you graduated your first class. Here you will have three. Three, said Eben, dismayed. It had taken him two months to learn to turn wood to stone in past Greedell's class. He did not relish the thought of taking more than half a year to graduate from this one. Three to pass, though I expect you to learn many more while you are here. The three tests are these. To turn your stone rod back into wood, which is harder than you might expect. To turn a flower to ice without changing its shape. And to turn obsidian white. The last one made Eben blink in surprise. Changing a stone's color? That cannot be harder than turning stone to wood. It is far, far more difficult, said Perrin gruffly. Matter has many properties. Some are simpler than others. Color is one of the strangest. Eben snickered, then stiff stifled it quickly as Perrin's eyes narrowed. My apologies, instructor. It is only that I do not take your meaning. Color is color. Oh, said Perrin. Tell me, what is stone? He blinked. It is, it is rock, the stuff of the earth. It comes from the ground and the mountains. And what is wood? The stuff of the trees. You cut them down and take them apart and there is your wood. And what is green? Eben blinked. I, it is the color of grass and leaves. It, no, those are things that have the color green. But what is green? A leaf may look green, but that does not mean it is green. What is color itself? You know, do you not, that there are those who cannot see colors, or to whom different colors look alike? People who see no difference between green and blue? Yes, said Evan slowly, I know this. If they do not see the green in a leaf, does that mean the leaf is no longer green? Of course not, Evan said, irritated. It is only something wrong with their eyes. Who is to say? Who is to say that we do not imagine the green in the leaf, and they see it for its truth? Who is to say that the color I see when I look at good tilled earth is not the same color you see in a cup of wine? Eben shook his head. That is ridiculous. I know what I see. Anyone does, if they are not mad. Ridiculous, you say, Perrin smiled grimly. Mayhap you are right, mayhap not. But you are a student, and the purpose of the student is to ask questions, not assume you know the answers already. You say you know you, what you see? Let me show you something. She placed her hand on the table. Light flooded the room as her eyes glowed with a furious luster, brighter than any Eben had seen. He focused on the hand, and then suddenly it was not there. It did not fade nor wisp away in smoke. It simply vanished. Eben jumped up with a cry. What happened? Perrin said through gritted teeth, forcing each word from her mouth. Why are you frightened? Your hand, said Eben. It, it is gone. It is not, said Perrin. It is there. I feel it. I am moving my fingers now. But I cannot see them. The glow died in her eyes, and her hand reappeared. She flexed her fingers, curling them into a fist, and then held it out towards Eben. He withdrew, frightened. She only wiggled her fingers. Go on, take my wrist. Slowly, tentatively, Eben did. Her hand enveloped his, gripping him firmly, solid, pe present, real. Eben shuddered. As he looked about the room, he saw that the other students were looking at them both with awe. He turned back to Perrin. How did you do it? It is difficult to explain, except that there is something, the air is how I perceive it, that controls how you are able to see my hand. I can twist it so that it shows you nothing, and so my hand disappears. Perrin looked around the room. That is a powerful spell of transmutation. Rarely can a wizard master it. And before you go thinking wild thoughts of my strength... Take note that even a small illusion required all of my... Oh... Concentration. There are transmuters in Underrealm who can make their whole bodies vanish, but if you never reach such skill, do not count yourselves among the weak. It is a rare ability. Also, you should all be working. The other students hurriedly dove back into their books and spells. Perrin turned her gaze on Eben again. Color is not nearly so hard. Yet it is far, far more difficult than simply changing the substance a thing is made of. You have learned to turn wood into stone, but with color you must go deeper, smaller, until you can find the thing that makes a stone appear gray, or black in the case of obsidian, and turn it white instead. I understand, said Eben, slowly nodding. Of course you do not, said Perrin, smiling a little. Not yet. That is why you are in my class. Though unless I miss my guess, you wish you had passed it already. Eben looked away. Is it so obvious? 
Do you think you were the first student to arrive late at the academy? When I attended, our oldest student was seen, had seen more than 20 years, though I would wager she faced less, faced less jibes than you, seeing as how she could tweak the ears of most children. That thought made Evan smile. Thank you, instructor. You are welcome. Now fetch your book again. Within it, you should find many bits of wisdom to help you master your first test. Perrin rose, the bench screaming in relief, and moved on to the next student. Evan went to the shelves to find his book, but once there he looked over his shoulder at Perrin. The instructor was a giant and often impatient, yet there was a deep-seated kindness in her heart that made Evan feel safe in her care, and certainly she was a far sight better than Creedel. He felt a stab of guilt at that thought and turned back to the bookshelf. Soon, Evan had found the book and returned to his seat. The spine cracked as he laid it out and began to read. He quickly lost himself in the words spelled out in careful, tiny script by some transmuter of ages gone, which spoke of the properties of different types of matter. Many of the terms whisked round and about in his mind, spinning until he felt dizzy. But he pinched his eyes shut and then open again, pressing on. The time whisked away as he lost himself in his studies, hardly mindful of the students practicing their magic around him. But after a time, his attention was dragged away from the pages as the door to the classroom clicked, open and, clicked and swung open. Everyone looked up to see Dasko, one of the advanced Wearmage instructors, a man with gray-flecked black hair whose beard was trimmed close. When Eben had fled Creedel's class in the mornings, he had often seen Dasko teaching students upon the grounds. His eyes roved... The instructor's eyes... The instructor's gaze went to Perrin, to whom he beckoned. Perrin frowned, then excuse. Perrin frowned and excused herself. Perrin frowned and excused herself from the student she was speaking to. When she reached the door, Dasko did not bother to lead her outside, but spoke quickly in whispers. Evan dropped his gaze to the book so he did not appear to be eavesdropping, but he leaned as far forwards as he could, cupping his left hand across his cheek so he could surreptitiously plug one ear. Still, he could hear little more than snatches, the artifact pendant, another vault. The whispers stopped abruptly. Evan could not help himself. He looked up. Dasko's eyes were fixed upon him, and he quickly looked back down, but the instructors did not resume speaking. Evan let his eyes wander, so it looked like an accident when he eyed the door again, but Dasko was still watching him, and now Perrin was too. Evan, said Perrin, come here if you would. The class went deathly silent. Evan's ears burned, but he tried to feign indifference as he stood and approached the instructors. This is Instructor Dasko. Perrin's voice was low and betrayed nothing. He brings a message from Instructor Gia. She wishes to speak with you. That took Evan completely unawares. Gia? What for? I imagine she will tell you. Off you go, but once you are done, return without dallying. Of course. Evan followed Dasko out into the hallway. The doors closed behind them with a sharp click. Perfect timing. That's four hours. Also, my son is not having a good time downstairs. My wife probably needs my help. <laughs> All right, y'all. And by y'all, of course, I mean word win. Um, uh, I'm going to go break for lunch. Might take a walk. Um, but I am going to come back and stream again this afternoon. Because I want to finish this book in two days. Two. And um, that's going to require a lot of work. But we can do it. We have to proofread this book, and then another book, and then one more book after it's done with Karen. But if I work, if I can manage to do, if I can manage to do a book in two, if I can manage to do two books in four days, then next Monday we start Yaren. Very excited. All right, y'all. Um, I will hopefully be back later today, all things willing and no disasters occurring. That is a ton of proofreading. Yes. But these books are very clean, very, very clean. The things I'm catching are the slightest little changes and differences and things that I've learned over editing the other six books. But anyway, all right, y'all, I will catch you another time. Maybe later today. Maybe not. Uh, bye.